Today's guest on The Andy Peacher Show is Dave Sharp, child abuse campaigner and survivor. Find Dave on Twitter at DaveSharp59. Yeah, welcome to the show. It's Andy Peacher. And today we've got Dave Sharp on campaigner, survivor um, for child sexual abuse. He's a survivor now, but what a story Dave's got to give you. Um, let me just play one promo and then we'll be right back. Horizon Talk Radio. Online from the Highlands of Scotland. We are voices from around the world. Hello. 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 Hi. Hello. 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 Yeah, hello. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you, Dave. Um, I wish I'd met you before today, but, you know, better late than never. Your man is uh-huh. God. Um, I must admit, you know, I try my best to pray, but... Life takes over, but I think it's more important these days, especially when the governments are not helping us and these poor people, and your story is horrific. Now, you said you're going to read a bit of a, a thing out to start the show. I think that's absolutely essential that you do. It's really brilliant, and, you know, um, do you want to carry on with that? Okay, Andy. Right. Um, nice to meet you at last. Uh, we've, we've spoke quite a few times over the years, um, but yeah, I just wanted to sort of start with this. This is something that uh, a leading Scottish academic said last year. She said, I fear sexually abused children are no better identified and detected in Scotland today than they were 30 years ago. Indeed, as a proportion of concerns raised through the child protection system, identification has dropped like a stone since the 1990s. A national review of the reasons is urgently needed. Concerns that this trend was such that in 2013, leading Scottish specialists and professionals working with child sex abuse met the Association of Directors Directors of Social Work, now called Social Work Scotland, about their deep concern that sexual abuse has been allowed to disappear off the statutory radar overshadowed by priority for other maltreatments, such as neglect and emotional abuse. So there you have it. This was last year, and this was a leading leading academic. And my my response was this. When you stop and try and figure out how many children we're talking about here, we're easily talking about over 100,000 children over the last 50 years only. And only then can you begin to realise the level of abandonment and abuse and re-traumatised caused by so many agencies when survivors dare come forward to have their voices heard. What we have had in Scotland over the last 50 years is a conveyor belt paralleled only by the lines of innocent Jews walking to the gas chamber. No one cared a jot about them and they walked into a trap of people claiming to want to help them only to send them to their deaths. This is no different to the revolving doors that survivors of child abuse go through their entire life in Scotland, looking for that one person, or that one group, or that one MSP, or that one GP, who might just be able to create that environment where they can open up old wounds and get the help they need to heal from the trauma of their childhood. But every step of the way they are met with rejection, false promises, let down the wrong path to a life of addiction, crime, prison, mental institutions, until they can take no more, then they take their abuse to the grave. And the reality is this, every single person in Scotland is responsible for us. The justice system, social services, child abuse agencies, and it's now time to press the pause button. We all know someone who was sexually abused in childhood, but we never seem to do anything about it. And that's why it's so important we, have to, we need to find the right people who are willing and able to sit down and have a national conversation about how we deal with this subject and how we treat survivors. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. And we will talk about the uh, national conversation later on. Can I just have a quick shout out? Thanks for people who are listening, um, that the audio is good. Many thanks for that. Hello to the survivor that did contact me today. Um, I will get in touch with you um, or pass you on to Dave. I don't know if he knows you already, but um, there was a conversation that we had together during the week, and I think Dave knows about this situation, and maybe he can comment better than I can, because 
I'm only the husband of a CSA survivor. I'm not actually a, a survivor myself. So, and, and Dave knows Scotland better than I do, even though I've lived up here a few years. Right, Dave, I think we should start. Um, and this is where I want to give a trigger warning. If anybody is feeling, you know, not very good what they hear today, try and stay safe. Try and call somebody if this affects you. You've got to be very strong and tough as bricks not to be affected. I mean... When he told me, I mean, I haven't told him that, but it, it absolutely shocked you. And it shocked you for the right reasons, because it's the truth. So, Dave, you was in care for the first 16 years. Give us an idea of, from your memory, what it was like. Um, did you have any brothers and sisters? How did you get into care? Um, how many homes did you stay in? And what was your typical day? Well, I was. Uh, I, I lost my mother before I was one. And I spent the first 16 years in care. I was in, um, as far as I know, I mean, we, we, we don't have any de definitive uh, outcome. I've had so many records produced. I've had so many uh, experts tell me who, what, where, how, when and how. But as far as I know, and this is my truth for what I know it, I spent the first 16 years in care. And I was in Kilmarnock, Nazareth House, Kilmarnock, um, from the age of one to the age of eight. <coughs> Uh, our, our day was spent, I mean, I, I often think about this, as if you can imagine a sort of room full of puppies, you know, it was an orphanage, we were all orphans, and I think we spent every day trying to grab the attention and the affection of anybody who came near us, you know, it was, um, I don't really have any bad memories of it, but um, yeah, it was uh, a typical orphanage in the sense that we were drilled, we were told where to go, when to go, you know, what to wear, you know, we didn't have any decisions to make. Um, so I guess in that sense, if you weren't one of the ones who were being abused, it could have been fun, it could have been healthy. Um, I don't have any negative memories, but at the age of eight, I was then taken to Nazareth House last week, Edinburgh, which I have no memory of. I have no memory to this day. Uh, apparently I was there from the age of 8 till the age of 11 for 3 years and as I say I've got no memory all I see is a dark hole but then at the age of 11 I was then taken to St Ninian's um, it's difficult to talk about it's difficult for people to listen to hear but I think it's important people need to hear the truth it, it's important for people to understand that I'm not the only one that went through these things, you know. It's important for people to know that there is thousands and thousands of survivors in isolation, addiction, rejection, abandonment throughout Scotland. Everybody knows this. But when I went in, it's... Sorry, Andrew. Yeah, I was going to say absolutely. If I butt in, it's because I'm, 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 I've got a couple of notes I've written down. And before we go into St Ninian's, because that was kind of the next part of this um, um, story. Jimmy Savile um, and Tam Payton from the Basic Rollers used to visit the last raid. Now, this was between 1960 and the 70s. Now, you were mm -hmm. def definitely there at that time. I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I'm guess guessing from mm -hmm. what you've told yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, is it possible that, you know, because they, they kept saying in the newspaper... They were showering the children with gifts. Is it possible that drink and drugs had an effect on the kids? And this is well, why well, they, I, they didn't, didn't know. This is one of the things that have come up often, or rather not come up, is the fact that, and, uh, now, I mean, if I start talking about St. Ninians, I have to talk about how I was taken into a room by this priest and how I woke up in the morning naked. And I often think, was I drugged? You know, my, my time in, in Las Wade for three years, you know, was I drugged? Then hopefully we'll move on further in the conversation when we talk about when I was trafficked over to Ireland, where we were drugged, you know. But also the fact that I was taken from St Ninian's back to Last Wade, which I've got no memory, but I've got every memory of, not, of St Ninian's. But if I just sort of carry on, when I went into St Ninian's, the, the, the first thing I encountered was I got, I got taken in a room with all the priests and stuff and introduced, and, and, and then I was left on my own to wander around. And, and I bumped into a bunch of guys, and, and these guys said to me, who are you? And, and I said, I'm, I'm Dave. And, and where are you from? I said, well, I'm from here. No, no, where are you from? 
I said, I'm from here. I said, where have you come from? I said, I don't know. What, what do you mean? Where, where were you before? And, and I, I didn't know, Andrew, because I spent my whole childhood in care. I spent my whole childhood not being asked these kind of questions. I just answered, you know, orders. I replied to all orders given to me. And, and for the first time in my life, people were asking me, you know, where do you come from? I said, I, I don't know. Said, where, where's your mum and dad? I said, I don't have one. And then they all started laughing and said, oh, you're an orphan. And I remember one of the boys coming over and they stick their head in me. He said, well, we're from Glasgow. He said, from now on, you do what we tell you. We run this, excuse me, we run this place. And don't you forget it. And I was left on the floor and I got up. And by the time I got to the recreation room, one of the priests was there. And he said, what happened to you? And I said, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't, you know, I was too scared to say what had happened. The guys were all there. And, and then started six years of bullying. In, in the end, I had to learn how to fight back. But, but shortly after that, what happened was one of the priests started coming into my room. And he would take me into his room. And he would put me on his lap. And he would cuddle me and he'd tell me how much he loved me, how nice I was. Uh, and then I would wake up naked, sometimes on his knee, sometimes in the bed. And he made me do things to him, which I have to say that I enjoyed. Because this was what's called the grooming process. And because I'd never had any experience of love, I enjoyed it. Uh, and then what happened was, in the dormitories, when we were in the dormitories, there used to be a wee boy in the next bed to me. And I used to pray every night, that he would get picked instead of me. His name was Joe. And sometimes my prayers were answered, sometimes they weren't. But what happened was, one day Joe disappeared off the face of the earth. And I kept on asking, where's Joe gone? He was my table tennis partner. We used to play table tennis every night. We never spoke, because we were being abused. We didn't understand what was happening. But he disappeared. And then this brother Ryan took me down to the shower unit, and he blindfolded me and he put a rope around my neck and he tied my hands behind my back and I heard other men coming in and he said to me, if you don't do what I tell you, you're going to get murdered just like Joe. And then they all proceeded to rape me. And then for the next six years, I lived a life of total domination. I, along with other boys, were taken over all over Scotland we were trafficked over to Ireland, where we were put into ritual abuses. Um, what is a ritual abuse? I'm often asked that question. We were taken into rooms where there would be up to 10 men, most of them naked. Um, there was a lot of red. The rooms were red. There was a lot of red wine being drunk and poured over us and made to drink. There was a lot of... Um, we, were, we had tomatoes thrown at us, strawberries. There's all kinds of strange things happening and then repeatedly raped. We we were also taken into houses, sometimes in Glasgow, and we remember also big big castle-type places on the west coast of Scotland, remote sort of, I, don't, I wouldn't say castles, big big houses where um, there would be coffins put in the back garden, and we would be put in, uh, and it would be left ajar, but they would simulate burial and throw stones over us and leave us in there for long periods of time. And again, then take us out and rape us. And, and this went on for the whole six years. Life was life was hard, mate. Life was very, very hard. Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't breathe or sleep or eat or blink without this man telling me what to do. Yeah, can we just let the listeners know there is a very um, distinct difference between ritual and satanic ritual. The ritual abuse is exactly what Dave has said and the, sat the satanist is the people who worship Satan. So that's satanic ritual. It's, ritual abuse is exactly, you know, the colours, the group of clergy, um, as David described. I mean, I, I, I was always curious about that um, yeah. because I, I thought it was the same. But I went to www.rasak.org.uk and it tells you clearly what ritual abuse is. Because um, some people, straight away, they say... Um, Oh, it can't be satanic ritual. It doesn't exist. But ritual abuse does exist. Anyway. Well, what, what, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've had lots of run-ins. I've mentioned satanic ritual abuse. And I, I've had um, 
what you call trolling on on Twitter, and and I, I've never looked at it. I'm not interested in it. I don't understand it. I, I don't want to know what it's about. I keep my well away from it, but it exists. And they don't want to be associated with religions like the Catholic, Catholicism. You know, it's kind of strange, but I understand it in a way. So I don't talk about it, Andrew. I don't mention it. But, but I, what I will say is that we, when we were there, uh, uh, being an orphan, you know, I, I remember in the summer times and the holidays where all the kids would go home. Minibuses would come and take all these kids home. Now, as, as the minibuses were going over the hill to leave Fife, Falkland and Fife, as they went over the hill, many buses would arrive full of priests who would come up for weekends and, and long periods of time to rape us. This is where, you know, it's um, we, we had single rooms. We, we were put in single rooms. And, and, and a lot of boys we, 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 you talk to now have nightmares still about the, the priests coming in at night time, up and down the corridors, drunk, steaming. Coming in, I remember like two or three at a time, really drunk, and they would literally bounce you off the walls. They would, um, I say priest, it's more Christian brothers. I have to emphasise that because um, I, I, I've spoke to many people about this, lawyers and, and, and campaigners and also survivors, and, and a lot of people agree that the Christian brothers, they, they, for some reason, they, they seem to be worse than anybody else. I, I don't, I can't really explain that because I can't, I, I don't have any comparables. But, but yeah, they were they were pretty ruthless, mate. They were they were, um, it was it was pretty ruthless existence there, you know. It's um, and as I say, this went on for six, right up to my sixteenth birthday. Yeah, and you, you was there from seventy one to seventy five, and um, I I believe um, you're going to explain to us what actually happened. During that abuse, um, especially the shower room and in the dark, I've heard from many people who went to the inquiry, um, just read it on, on the internet, how they seem to be punished before they're being raped. Uh, mm -hmm. with a kind of ritual abuse again, surely. It's funny you're saying that, because I've got written down here, and we haven't spoken. I've got written down here. What, one of the, the, the sadistic things they used to do, one of the things is that, that I remember in morning assembly, I would get taken in front of the whole school and I would get 12 of the bell on each hand. But I had no idea what I'd actually done. And, and, and when you talk about abuse of power, th this is abuse of power. Th this is where these people rampaged our souls. You know, th these people destroyed us, everything that we were about, you know. And, 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 and you often hear, Andrew... Many, many times you hear of, of kids who ran away. I, I remember one time I ran away with two other boys, or three other boys, and, and we ran away, we got to the woods, and, and we lit a fire, and we're all sitting around this fire, and um, this boy said, oh, I can't wait to get to my family in Glasgow, and I'm, I'm going to get a bottle of wine, and I'm going to get my girlfriend, and, and I'm going to see my mum, and then the other guy, I'm going to do this, I'm gonna, and he came to me, and I thought, well, hang on a minute, I haven't got any family, where am I going? And I had to turn around and go back. And often as well, we got caught. I got caught once by the police. And the police wouldn't do it. They took you back. And you imagine the existence of, of a 12-year-old, 13, 14-year-old kid. You, you, you've got no resistance. You, you, you've got no defence mechanisms. You, you, have to, you have to comply. You have to submit to these depraved monsters. And, and whatever they come up with next, you know, as I say, you knew... You knew. I mean, for example, I, I, I've got in front of me here. I've been looking. I've been looking at stuff all week for for this radio show, and and I've got box. I, I must become. I didn't realise I was such a hoarder. I've got so many boxes of stuff. But I remember when I finally met the Christian Brothers. This is sort of in two thousand fourteen or something like that. And they they gave me. I've got here my records for St Ninians. And I mean, I could read it in thirty seconds. I got caught shoplifting, and I also broke into the tuck shop, and I won a table tennis competition. That, that's my record for, for St Ninians. And it's, it's like they're trying to paint me as being this bad person. I mean, I look at it and I think, a lot, of, a lot of psychiatrists would look at this and say, obviously stealing would be a cry for help, you know. But um, the, the, the level of cover-up, it, it's... It, it, it's the, the, the fact that they believed 
and to a large extent they still do, believe that they can get away with this. Where we all know, we all know now that the, the net is closing in, Andrew. The, uh, worldwide, the net is closing in, you know. But Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Do, sorry to interrupt again, but you know what, what really got me going? Um, this is where, you know, I, I'm a man to hide it. But when you were telling me about how they hung you by a cord, and then the, I read the rest in the newspaper, threatened with murder. I mean, this is typical of what they do to young children. Um, I, yeah, I've mentioned yeah. my, my wife as an example in Nazareth, in Cadonald. She was told, do not tell. Loads of them, you know, survivors of do not tell. What, what's really annoying, this is typical what you're saying of the system. They only, in fact, m most of the people who listen will agree with me. They lodge you, log you in, sorry, as an arrival and a departure. Your parents or the state will sign you in and out. But they don't actually write down the day-to-day -day stuff. Oh, Dave wet the bed today. I mean, these are examples. You, you probably didn't. It doesn't matter. You know, Dave wet the bed. Paula did this. Sammy mm. went there, you know. Yeah, did, yeah. Didn't do the day-to-day -day stuff. At least, I suppose, with your records, at least you went to the stealing at the tuck shop. <laughs> yeah. Well, what you've got to remember as well, Andrew, is that, um, that, that while we were being abused... Not only our families, but all the communities were being threatened. I mean, people often say to me, you know, and I, I, we say, why don't Scottish people talk about it? Scottish people are terrified to talk about Scottish be uh, child abuse, sorry. I, I believe because it's re because of religious dominance, not just over decades, probably over centuries, you know, and, and we were brought up not to talk about it. Our families were threatened. And, and you know, and when you go back to St. Ninians, one of, one of the things... You're talking about the showers and the things there. Well, one of the things that they used to do to me was that, that when you when you had a shower, you'd all line up. And this is in the winter, there's no heating. And, it, and it's you're down in a cellar, this is a 16th century building that looks like something that's so gothic, you know, even Dracula would, wouldn't go there. But when they used to line us up when we'd finish a shower. And if anybody spoke, you were left behind. Now, quite often I didn't. I was too terrified. I was I was shaking. And all of a sudden, shut! Get over there! I told you not, and I haven't said a word. And they would leave you there all night in the dark with just this little tea, tiny towel. They would leave you there all night in the freezing cold. And sometimes you would hear the keys rattling. And, when, and he'd be coming down. And he'd come down and he'd bend you over. And he'd pull out a tall, a, a strap. And, and beat you. Beat you black and blue and then rape you. And then leave you there. You know, this this was regular. This is, uh, again, what we'll find out later on in the conversation is that when we go forward to, to 2012, when I finally got in touch with, when the Daily Record took up the case, you'll see that, you know, uh, uh, dozens, dozens of men came forward with the exact same stories, you know, people who also were taken over to Ireland. But, and, 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 and the thing is that, you know, Lady Smith said recently, Lady Smith said recently, just a couple of weeks ago there, she says, before the public inquiry started, for 13 years, this government, Scottish government, did everything it could to not have the public inquiry. Now, I'll go further, because I was here, I was there, I was doing the campaigning. They did everything they could to, to what's the word I'm looking for, to, to prove us, to, to call us liars. I'm trying to think of the word, to, to question us and, and to... But, you know, I, I, I'm trying to find the word but, that to prove us that we were lying and, and turn people against each other. It was so nasty, you know, but then the evidence, and over the years you find, again, I had so much evidence and so much proof of what had happened that, that nobody could doubt it. You know, nobody could doubt it. And, uh, but yeah, I, I, and then at, at the end of this, you know, when I was in St. Ninians, I, I remember I was taken into a room and uh, by this time, I, I wasn't getting beat up so much because I started to fight back. I had no option. Even though I was only sort of four foot nothing, I, I, I couldn't keep taking the beatings. I, keep, I couldn't keep taking the, the rapes and everything else. And, and I, I, I guess I must have turned into some sort. I don't know. I mean, I've never a hard man. I'm not a fighter. I've, I've never won a fight in my life. But, um, but yeah, I, I just learned. I just survived. It's just, I just survived. And I remember sort of uh, a couple of weeks before my 16th birthday, they, they took me into a room 
and they said, right, you're going to be moving because you're only here till you're 16. Because in those days, that was the way the, the system ran. No matter what age you are, when you went into these places, you stayed there till your 16th birthday. But, but the likes of me, I came from an orphanage. I hadn't committed any crimes. So why was I moved from Last Wade to what's called a list D school, which was for offenders? It's a question I've still never had answered. You know, I've, I've, I've met one or two other guys with similar stories, but I still haven't found out why would somebody who's obviously committed no crime, because I'm in an orphanage, get moved to there? And now all of a sudden what they did is they took me into this room and they says, you're going to be moved to a hostel when you're 16. It's got other men in it. And I thought, I don't like the sound of that. It sounds very much like this place. So I says to the guy, I says, listen, can't you sort of find out if I've got any family? All these guys are going home at the weekend and they come back, you know. I mean, at this point, I hadn't even wore long trousers. You know, we all, we all, we all wore shorts and these, but all these guys used to come home come back to the, the, the home after weekends with new, the new gear, the latest fashions and guitars. I thought, what have, why haven't I got that? What, what's, what am I, why am I so different? I didn't know what, what, you know, I had no idea what had happened. And, and then about two weeks or a week or something before I was about to go, my, my name came on the Tannoy system. Now, in the six years I'd been there, my name had never, ever, ever been mentioned. And everybody kind of froze and went... Dave Sharp report to the social services department. I'm like, what? You know, I, I was just a piece of furniture. I was just somebody who no, no, nobody took any notice of. It was just, you know. So I went up there and, and this guy says, this probation officer said, we found your family. I said, what? He said, you've got a father. He lives in Glasgow in Postal Park. I thought, wow. He said, uh, how would you like to go and visit him? I said, are you serious? Wow. He said, we've arranged it for you. You're going to go next weekend for the weekend. And I remember running out the belt, running out the room. And I'm running through the building, running back down to the woodwork class. And I'm running down the stairs shouting, I'm not an orphan. I'm not an orphan. Yeah. And I was so, I just couldn't understand. I couldn't believe the, 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 the happiness. I thought, I'm not an orphan. And I ran in. I said, I'm not an orphan. I'm from Glasgow. And everybody, obviously, it meant nothing to them. They thought, oh, you know. But, yeah, that was it. And and there there came the end of my 16 years in care, Andy. That was when it all ended and a new chapter in my life was about to start. Uh, I went home, I went for the weekend to this house and there was a guy sitting there who was drunk. But there was all these other people. There was, uh, my aunties, my brothers, my sisters, my granny my uncles, and all these people were giving me money, you know, and I, I'd, I'd never seen money, I'd never, you know, all we had in the home was we had a tuck shop where you go and you buy sweeties on a Wednesday, sweeties on a Saturday, I'd never handled money or, and I remember they took me down to the bars and they bought me all these clothes and, yeah, it was just an amazing, an amazing experience and when I went back they said, how would you like to go and live? I said, yeah, yeah, it'd be great. And and so it was arranged that in a couple of weeks' time, I was going to go and live with my dad in Glasgow. Wow. Um, I've got a couple of <clears throat> things to sort of mention about, you know, survivors and, um, yeah, how, how difficult it is, you know, when, when you are that age, I mean, to be believed. I mean, it's just equally as hard... Nowadays, to be believed, okay, they've got the inquiry, but what's annoying more than anything, um, I guess you were one of the lucky ones because um, you got some compens- oh. <laughs> you got some compensation. Sorry, all oh, right, um, sorry. Right. <laughs> a, a lot of survivors are being told by their lawyers now. Any child abuse lawyer in Scotland tells you the same. We've been to three. And they've had the same opinion in, in our wife's case. Under Scottish law, you have to co- corroborate your information. Or there's a word that means that. Um, it basically means that if Tom, Dick or Harry in the home said, yeah, I remember him or her, then you both can do like a, a mini class action. But if mm-hmm. you can't um, you know, agree with each other's 
stories and go to the lawyer and, you know, they take statements. A Scottish law then will leave you alone and say, look, you can't claim nothing um, that way because, you know, um, you basically haven't got enough proof. I mean, what did they want in them days? A signed confession by a child or, f <laughs> sorry, a signed confession by the abuser. Um, and, yeah. and, the, and these days, there's just nothing out there for them to prove that this happened to get their compensation. Now, OK, the redress scheme goes a little way if you sign your waiver, just in case other evidence appears. I mean, it's ridiculous what's going on. Why give well, oh, yeah. a proper, well, fair system? Why give well, Tom um, 10 grand, Peter 20 grand, we'll come at this a bit later on, and 100 mm -hmm. grand to Lily, you know? Why can't they all yep. just get the same figure? Whether you've been raped once or 10 times, been in there one week or 10 years, surely you're all experiencing the trauma, especially... Um, I, I've met a few survivors, and every one of them... And I guess it's not their own fault. I guess they're still dealing with it badly. Every time they told me their story, whether they told me once or ten times, they cried every time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've cried a few times over the last couple of days, um, you know, reflecting. I hate that word. I, I just hate that word. But let's get back to Nazareth House. Look, I mean, let's be clear here. I mean, the public inquiry, it didn't do any justice at all. I mean, if you're talking about Nazareth House, I was in Nazareth House last week and Kilmarnock. Now, we, we've only discovered this week that your sister, I uh, sorry, your wife, uh, Joanna, was in the same home as my sister, Cardonald, Nazareth House. Absolutely. Now, in, in over 50 years, you've got Nazareth House, Kilmarnock, Nazareth House, Edinburgh, Last Wade, and you've got Nazareth House, um, Glasgow, Cardonald, and Aberdeen. Now, there was between 50 and 60 or 70,000 children in those homes during that period. Now, we had one or two, if anybody's watching. I mean, we, we, we watched the, the public inquiry. But what, what, what was very, very disturbing is we, we were watching and listening and reading the papers and seeing these really awful, disturbing stories. You know, I know, I know many, many, many people, many people who were in these homes in Nazareth House, you know, who suffered the most horrific. Some of the stories is just incredible. But while we were watching this, the, 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 I remember seeing the, the politicians in Parliament talking about some something else, something all sitting there laughing. And I thought, you know, where's your priority? You know, there's sort of 50, 60,000 children here. That's just in one home, to one, one organisation. And yet, here's the thing. See, when you look at the child abuse inquiry, according to their, their, their um, statements, and, and if you do delve deep enough, and I say this, I talked about this a lot, only 35 people came forward, according to the inquiry. Now, that's less than 1%, you know, and, and, and then you start talking about, and this is what we're going to get onto with the redress scheme, it's that word, there's no awareness, there's no awareness programme, nothing has been set up to look for these children, to look for these parents now, like your, your, your wife, you told me the story about how it's affected her whole life, we know there's thousands, thousands of people through bedsits, homeless centres, hostels, you know, who have been abandoned, isolated in addiction for decades and no one cares. No no one, you know, that this 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 thing about corroboration, you know, they know what happened. Of course they know. And and, and as we speak, I've got in front of me here, you know, and again it's to do with the redress scheme. And it's just interesting, Andrew, it's just paragraph twenty seven of this latest bill that we're going to talk about later on. You know, I've already mentioned, I mean, you, the, 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 the fundamental question everybody's asking now is, and especially given the latest reports from France with the Catholic Church, 333,000 children abused in, in, in the last 50 years in France. Well, i actually seen the spreadsheet of all the countries, you know, at least 10 or 12 countries in the world. If you think that's bad, Italy's coming next. Italy's a million. And then you've got America, it's a million. Then you've got Poland at something like 450,000. Germany's half a million. So when you talk about Scotland, 100,000 is not, it's, it's not unfeasible. It's very, very realistic. But then I read here, and this is what the Scottish government are saying about this redress scheme. Building on the experiences of other redress schemes, 
The following assumptions in terms of this division of claims are set out below. It is anticipated that only the most severe experiences of abuse would attract a payment of 100000 with these payments being the smallest proportion of the overall redress payment made. The largest proportion of payment is most likely to be 20000 followed by a smaller proportion of payments at 40000 This approach is supported by the experiences of claims distribution in other schemes. Now, I'm sorry... How can you possibly, how can you possibly collate or, or compare? We're, we're talking about a different culture. We're talking about a country where people are terrified to talk about child sex abuse. Now, I, 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 we talk about the justice system. We talk about the social services and all these people. It, it, it is one thing I learned to deal with, Andrew, is my anger. I, I, I've dealt with my anger. That, that's gone. And, and I'm trying to reach out to these people and saying, listen, unless we come together... You know, I, I firmly, I firmly of the belief that the only way that we can deal with this terrible, terrible thing that we're dealing with now is to take the responsibility away from the politicians and sit down and have a conversation. How can we, you know, it's been, it's been suggested many times. If all the survivors of historical child abuse were to come forward, it would cost in excess of £700 million, pounds, you know, uh, which obviously would have an impact on the economy and the police... just our golden opportunity to say, right, you know, I'm talking about people like Ian Duncan Smith, what, just one lawyer of the year, you know, a, a fantastic man with vision, who's making great progress, but but when you're looking in, it's so slow, and, and, and it's, it, we, we're, we're trying to push, we want these things to happen quicker, but what I'm saying is, if all the right people, if Ian got all the right people round about him, survivors, not just survivors, who are in care, but people like myself, 63, 64 years of age, with this lifelong experience, people like, uh, there's an organisation now called Epion Training, and, and there's a guy called, um, sorry, I forgot his name for a second there, Alex, Alex O'Neill. He's a social worker, and he's a very good social worker, and he reached out to me, and, and what he does is, Epion Training, it's, it's, it's focused on trauma, you know, trauma awareness. And he sort of picked up on this, that, 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 that the effect trauma has on the whole of society. And he, he, he has the same vision as me about getting everybody sitting together, how we can open this whole thing up. And, and we, if we do this right, Scotland's small enough. Seriously, Scotland is a small enough country where we can have a, pro, a, a, a programme or a system in place where we can create an environment where people... We, 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 people feel safe enough to come forward. Uh, we have children coming out of care, going straight into crime, addiction, imprisonment, and early graves. Why is that still happening? We can stop this. We, we can deal with this. We're a small enough country. We've got enough people there. But again, I keep, every time I hear this, every time I mention it, I keep hearing the same thing, the same record over and over again. Dave, you're 100% right. Yeah, you are. And let's go into that a little bit more afterwards because there's so much to that, you know. Um, was going to have a break, um, but the promos don't want to do us justice tonight. So okay. let's, let's move on to Brazil um, and then the, the attempted suicide, the homeless, the drug habit. Um um, and so on. Okay, okay. I uh, I left home at 16, and I went to stay with my dad. Uh, as I say, I, I often think about how hard it must have been for him. My sister lived there as well. And, and I, I, you know, it's... I was 16 years of age. I had no experience. I had no upbringing. I had no nur nurturing. I had no... You know, no guidance, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, you know, there was this guy who went out to work in the daytime, came home. So most times he'd come in drunk. And, and I would be sitting there. He'd say, you need to go and sign on the door. You need to do this. And you need, and I, I, I don't know. I had no idea. I, I, I had no idea what, what to do. I remember my sister telling me once, when are you going to change your underpants? And I said, I don't know. When am I supposed to? 
<laughs> Sorry. Because I, I had no idea, Andy. Every day, every day when we woke up, we woke up to new new bed and new new clothes at the end. Of, I'd never experienced when to change my... Because everything was changed every day, so I didn't know. I was waiting for somebody to do it, but I had no idea. You know, these little things all mounted up. And very, very quickly, the whole the whole atmosphere changed very, very quickly. And, um, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, I remember once... What happened was I started staying out more. And I started hanging about with some guy. This is the early 70s. And they started... We used to go into town pickpocketing and, and smoking drugs and, and smoking this and smoking that. And um, I came in once very drunk and I shouted at him. And he picked up a brush and he smashed my face and my nose was broken and I still see it every day when I look in the mirror. And, and, and I remember, I remember one time staying out and it made the middens, the, the rubbish bit in the back. And I remember staying out and, and I went into the rubbish tip and I fell asleep. I found an old duvet cover and, and I fell asleep and I was looking up to the sky and, and something happened. I've just felt this peace. And I remember, I remember a rat came by. And I remember lying there looking at this rat and not feeling scared. And it was looking at me. And for that split second, it was my pal. You know, and, and I often say when I do write my book, I, I'm going to call it, my best friend was a rat. Because, you know, I've seen it again. I did it a few times and it came back. I don't know if it was the same one or not. But yeah, I, I, something happened that, that when I, when I was out sleeping rough, I found a piece because, all my life, all my life I've been scared of doors, the doors getting kicked in and priests coming in to rape me. Even to this day, I struggle wearing headsets, you know, listening to music because I'm constantly watching for the door. You know, it's, it's something I've never got over. And um, so I started staying out more. And uh, yeah, it was, it was nightmare part two. And what happened was uh, one day I got up and I realised that I'd owed drug dealers money. I'd, pay, I'd, I'd no idea about paying it back. And one night we were in town, a group of us, and a gang fight happened. And I got stabbed. And, and nobody told me the rules. They jumped at us, you jumped there, we bumped and we go back. And a load of guys jumped on me and I got a knife in the back. And I got taken to hospital and I came out. And all of a sudden, I was like a celebrity. And I thought, this is strange. You know, I've almost died. I've had a whole blood transfusion. And all of a sudden, everybody wants to be my pal. You know, and that's when Sharpie was born. My nickname was called, I've got it hand tattooed on my, my hand now, Sharpie. And then a couple of, a couple of nights later, we're going, we're going this, we're going to do this, we're going to go gang fight. And I thought, no, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to play this game. I, I, I don't like it. I, I'm not very good at it. <clears throat> and I quickly made more enemies than friends. And then, as I say, my drug habit soon took off quite quite rapidly. And so one day I decided I was going to pack a suitcase and just go. And, and that's what I did. I um, got up very early in the morning, got a bag, and I walked from Postal Park down to um, the zoo. Uh, not the zoo, the motorway, sorry, I'm by the zoo. The motorway, and I hitched a lift down to England because I knew I had a brother in Northampton. And, and it took me three days. And I remember, I mean, I had no sense. I couldn't even spell map, never mind find one or know where I was going. I just knew I was going to Northampton. And I remember I ended up in Leeds. And, no, sorry, I remember, first of all, I ended up in Gretna Green. And right beside Gretna Green, there's a place called the Silver Bridge. Are you, do you know it? Yeah. You do, yeah? Yeah, I've stayed there's, there. The, there's a place called the Silver Bridge. And, and I got off there and I went under the, the tunnel where the river is and I walked about half a mile and I found a place where there was no motors, no houses, nothing, just just countryside. And I stayed there for three days. And I, and I, I, I caught fishing lines, hooks, and I made a little tent out of the trees, a, a, a cover, and it was the most peaceful just an amazing time of, of peace. But, and I didn't want to leave. But in the end, I think something happened. Somebody caught me and I had to go. And I got back on the motorway and I went to Northampton and I met my brother. But um, by that stage, 
my drug addiction had t- kicked in, and I quickly found out the big lights in London. So I went to London, and um, yeah, then began 25 years of addiction, chaos, mayhem, mental health issues, in and out of prison, in and out of mental health centres. Um, yeah, quite a quite a chaotic existence. For over 20 years, I, uh, I injected drugs every day. Yeah, tell um, me the, the little story, um, is it called The Circle, where you're kind of in a circle all the time, from prison to addiction to um, you know something else. I can't remember what you called it now. What, the uh, revolving doors? The revolving doors, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what it is. I mean, it still exists today. You know, we've got so many. We've got children now coming out of home. People say to me now quite often, Andy, what's changed in 50 years, Dave, since you came out of a home? I say, it's worse. We, we know it's worse. We know. We know that here, here's the thing, Andy, right? In the last 50 years, between 60 and 75 percent of those who are or were in addiction were sexually abused as children. The only thing that's changed over the last 10 years or so is those that are dying are getting younger and younger and younger. Now, you have to ask yourself, why is that? Why is nobody... It just proves that nobody's dealing with this situation. So what we have is, for 25 years, I was I went through this revolving door, you know, and what what, what, what you find is that, you know, people are, people are holding these wounds in, deep, deep wounds that they can't open up. And, and I mean, I, 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 I don't know how many doors I kicked in just to be listened to. But I, I'm as much to blame in, in the sense that once those doors were open, what, what, what is it, Dave? What can I help you with? You know, I'm a drug addiction. You know, and, and I had this dark secret, Andy, remember? I'm still carrying this dark secret. This affected every relationship I had, even in prison, in the mental health hospitals, you know? Uh, I mean, we'll go on to later on when my wife died. Uh, you know, uh, uh, And then when, when I discovered, it wasn't until later on I discovered the amount of times that I'd actually overdosed, the amount of times that I'd actually attempted suicide, this this was a complete chaotic period which still exists for an awful, awful lot of people. I was speaking to Alex O'Donnell about this the other night. We were talking about the dark world and how many, how quick people in this country, in Scotland, are quick to, to you know, we all want to do stats and talk about, you know, the, the, the drug addiction, you know, and, and that's, you know, but what they don't talk about is the underlying issues. Everybody's, you know, these, I mean, I, I've got to be careful because I, I made a promise to myself today. I'm not going to come on here and name names. I'm not going to come in here and cry. I'm going to keep my self-respect, you know, and my self-dignity. But, but I, I get so, and there's so many people that are, you know, they're shouting to the rooftops and, and all the rest of it. And, and so many people I speak to, they say, well, Dave, I was sexually abused myself and I've never actually dealt with it. And these are people that are public speakers. These are people who are on the streets. And and it, it, it's got me in a lot of trouble, Andy. It, it has got me in a lot of trouble because there's a lot of people who really are doing a lot of good work, you know. But at the same time, because, because there's no structure, because there's no monitoring... Because there's not, you know, but when's the last time you heard anybody doing a survey on how many survivors of child abuse we have? How many, how many times did, have you heard being a, doing a survey of the effects of child abuse survivors through the pandemic? It doesn't exist. And it leaves these doors open for people just to go in and rampage and do what they want with survivors. And they cause so much more damage than good. And as I say, it is, it's like, a, I call it the dirty washing machine. Mm-hmm. And, and again, when you talk about the, 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 the revolving doors, this is, this is exactly what's happening now. It's just there's so many people who, again, I was giving an example to, to Alex the other night. This is true. I've done this myself. And I know a lot of people. I know people who walk. They walk from one town to the next or one village to the next. Now, they can't go in the cities or the towns and they can't go in the homeless centres because they're so vulnerable that they know that they'll get mugged and probably raped. So they'd rather not have contact with people. Now, there's people who here who will start off in Dover and spend a year walking to Newcastle. And they're content, they've got the prescription, they've got the script. So they know 
But th- th- this is the kind of abandonment. If if we created a vo- an environment that that we could reach out to these people, do you imagine the, the the good we can do to so many people and keep them out of prisons, keep them out of mental hospitals? All it takes is just people to stop, press the pause button, and look at these revolving doors. You know, I did a thing today on Twitter. And, 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 and I'm so glad that the people I was talking to weren't offended. I said, it, it, it's, not, it, it's no good lawyers getting awards for stopping children going into prison. I would rather the lawyers focused on suing the people who are making the, pe- the children have lives of crime. And again, it, it's about stopping and going back and looking. Why have we got so many people going through these revolving doors? But my, my story is horrific. But as I say, when I was in London... I was a 16-year-old child, and I remember very, very vividly, I I remember sitting there, and we had repeated, repeated, repeatedly children appearing. You know, this is the days of, um, what do you call it, the um, Cardboard City. You know, Cardboard City was like a festival to a lot of people. And we had all these kids turning up, and all these kids would turn up with rucksacks. And they all had the same thing in it. They all had two things in it. Every one of them was the same. They had two things in the rucksack, and one was a change of clothes, and one was pictures of their family. And, and I remember I was sitting there, and one young kid would say to me, Dave, I've got a punter. Because a lot of these kids became prostitutes and rent boys to survive. And I remember him getting into a nice big flash Jaguar. And he said, I'll be back in an hour. And after an hour, he didn't come back. And then after two hours, he still hadn't come back. And then I waited and waited all night, he didn't come back. And then all the next day I waited, because you see, at that time, I was the only friend he had in the world. And he was the only friend I had. But after two or three days, I realised he's not coming back. And then what happened is, after the weeks going on and on, I used to wake up, I was a pickpocketer, I was a shoplifter, I never did anything like that. I, I I stole to survive. That was my, I stole. I was a thief. And and it, what would happen is I, I would get so out of my head, I'd wake up in derelict buildings. And as the light came in, shone into the building, you would look. And as the light shone in, you would see dozens and dozens of empty rucksacks. And you're thinking, this is what's happening to our children. Isn't that sad? It's very sad. Can I just come and... Because um, we're at a good stage here and the time is good. Um, talk about this mental health um, revolving door uh, prison. Now, I don't like to talk about my story or my wife's, purely because it's your show and you know I want to give you that respect. But there's always similarities in everybody's story. Now, mm-hmm. after Joanne had um, told the um, police and the child abuse inquiry, um, well, that came a little bit later, the inquiry, um, what happened to her, and they believed her, you know, still not heard from them since, but, yeah, they believed her, she made the statement, blah, blah, blah. Um, it, it then triggered off some trauma that last, well, still lasting today, so it's about 10 years now since she reported it, and mm-hmm. she went into a life of crime, only small crime, you know, basically telling the police that she hated them because they hadn't investigated her complaint very well. And she had some prison time for that. And ever since then, she's been on this medication that you mentioned that that you was on for so many years. And Like actual? Yeah, it's it's a ridiculous way of trying to deal with the problem. I think, my wife in particular, yeah, money's good. It's It's a sorry, it's a thank you. Sorry, sorry, even, and, and that that would be enough, I think, to move her forward. Okay, mm-hmm. we have to deal with the drugs. The drugs will come into it. Um, in other words, we can get rid of drugs, and so can other people when they've given you the proper trauma therapy. Because mm-hmm. yep. Joanne's looking at this, and I hope all them survivors out there are listening. Looks as the Redress Scotland scheme, the inquiries the compensation from their lawyers, if they get any, um, is the end of it now. Let's try Mm -hmm. and move on. They'll never move on properly, but let's try and move on. And you can do that with some trauma therapy, proper stuff that actually works. There's a good guy in Edinburgh, um, 
the only problem is he works with a um, future pathways. It's called Ian Connor, and mm-hmm. instead of doing it privately, which he's the best in Scotland, by the way, at this. Well, sorry that we know. Um, he passes you back onto the NHS, which is ridiculous, mm-hmm. because he was talking. About, he'd done a big report, and we thought, brilliant. She's going to get the talking therapy she deserves. Um, and he recognised PTSD, whereas mental health doesn't recognise that as a, a condition anymore. But mm-hmm. the point I'm making is, these talking therapies, it's got to work better than drugs, surely. I mean, go back to your case now. You were very lucky. Um, maybe not, actually. We can all do it, because every time I pray to God, I seem to get guidance and support. I won't go into a church because I don't, um, I don't kind of like churches. Only what you told me, uh, my hometown of Peterborough, you loved our cathedral. Well, that kind of church is good, but I don't want to be part of a religion. I want to talk to Jesus and God if he's the same person. It doesn't matter. Um, and let him guide me. Um, mm-hmm. cause, cause that's what turned your life around, didn't it? Um, yeah. Um, and you can tell us, about Alice, she's oh, yeah. so, okay. so, okay. so sweet. Um, from the the newspaper article, uh, yeah. you, uh, when when your wife died, um, and that gave you the breakdown, and then then God came mm-hmm. along. Yeah, tell us all well, about that. Okay, C- can I just say first of all, when you talk about Joanne, your your wife, you know, you talk about therapy. Here's the thing, Andrew, and this is what we're trying to say. We're, we're, this is what we're looking at this redress scheme. Now, if you've been a drug addict all your life. And Joanne's got a powerful family, yourself behind her. But you talk about somebody who's got no one who's, who's um, relying on an addiction, uh, uh, you know, that, that's, that's clinging them on to life, basically. £10,000 could be a death sentence. But here's the thing. £10,000 with the proper counselling could be life-changing. Absolutely. And, and that's the kind of promise we're looking for. That's what we're asking with the redress scheme. Stop, you know, stop... Putting these words, uh, we 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 know, we we know. Well, okay, they're putting more money in. You know, a, 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 another interesting fact is that you know, with this redress scheme, every single person on the payroll is going to earn more than any survivor is going to get. So let let's see that money used in the right direction. You know, let let's see proper counselling coming into this. Let's see, you know, marrying up the survivors. All this they've already started. What the what the what the the the, the, the Inquiry was doing, cancelling appointments and letting people down before it's even started. So that, that's that's all I want to say. We'll probably get back onto that later on. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I I'd never had a girlfriend. I, I had a couple, and and I know people won't be offended. I, I certainly wouldn't want to offend women when I say this, but uh, most of my relationships up to that point were drug related in, in the sense that we were both looking for something. You know, I had a lot of drugs. And I needed affection and love, and, and it never lasted long because I couldn't handle relationships. But um, yeah, I, and what happened was uh, I, I met Alice. You know, I was I was twenty over twenty years into addiction, mental health issues, and, and all of a sudden this woman came into my life. She was only twenty three years of age. She was from Greenock, and um, she became my best pal. She, we, we kind of became inseparable. And the thing I loved about her was that whenever I tried to talk about my past, she had, a, she had this way of putting her finger on my lips and saying, Shh, and, and, and I, I thought, this is an angel from heaven. You know, I, I, here's me running throughout my life, running away from people, upsetting people who got close to me. And, and this woman, she wouldn't, I couldn't leave her. She couldn't, you know, she just always wanted to be there with me. And uh, she had her own place, and, and I stayed over at her place, and sex never came into it. It was just inseparable. Just, it was just a, a magical, magical feeling. And uh, you, you hear about people who live for the moment. Yeah. That was that was Alice, you know. And then one day she says to me, she says, uh, I've got something to tell you. And I'm like, go on. And she was teasing me. All day she was teasing me. And uh, jumping up and down and, you know, just... And eventually she says, I, I, I'm pregnant. I said, what? She says, I'm pregnant. Because we started having, say, we got really close and started having, say, you know, and I, I didn't, it didn't enter my head. I, I've got no sort of idea about, you know. And uh, 
I was like, my God. And I started crying. I said, I've never had a family. I said, what do I do? I, 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 I was just, I didn't know what to say. I, I was speechless and, you know, it was just amazing. So I did the honourable thing. And five weeks after, uh, sorry, uh, on 20th of April, 1998, I did the honourable thing. And we got married at the registry office. And uh, we were just a young couple. I was what was I, nearly 40 at the time, and uh, I was just like a big kid, I couldn't, I couldn't, be, I couldn't be happier, I, I started using less drugs, I wouldn't fix, inject in front of her, but, but, you know, it didn't seem to matter, it just didn't, she knew I did it, but even when I was on the streets, I didn't like to fix in front of other people, but all of a sudden, this changed my whole life, so I did the honourable thing, and I married her, and we'd go out for a meal, get for a drink. And on the way home, we would sort of tig each other and play like, like two kids. Uh, and then exactly five weeks after we were married, we went home one night and went to bed. And I woke up in the morning at seven o'clock and the curtains were drawn. And she was lying on top of me. And I noticed she was stiff. And I thought, what's, what's going on here? And I, I went to touch her and it was just, she was a bit cold and something was wrong. So I jumped out of bed and I opened the curtains and I put the light on and she was lying there and she turned blue. She was just something not right. And the way she was lying, her face had kind of stretched over a bit and she looked not like an ape, but just something disfigured, you know. And so I ran downstairs and I ran next door and I shouted to the guy, I said, mate, can you come in? I said, there's something wrong with my wife. And he came in and he said, she's dead. I said, what are you talking about? She can't be. He said, yeah, she's dead. So the police were called. Um, ambulance was called I remember I, I don't know if I got an injection or I got a tablet but they took me straight away straight into the mental hospital and um, after a few days they came and said Alice had died the baby's dead um, it was okay and I was in there for a long period of time and uh, then they eventually told me oh, months later we went to the um, inquiry that she died of natural causes. And, and I mean, I, even if you go back, I remember when, when, even when I was dating her, I, I used to say to her, nothing better happened to you because a lot of bad things have happened to me in my life. Nothing. And she used to say, don't be stupid. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. I said, no, you don't understand. A lot of bad things have happened to me. It's going to be all right. And all of a sudden now she was gone. And, uh, you know, and they put me in and I was medicated for a, for a long period of time. And, um, yeah, it was a very, very hard time. And um, eventually I got released. And I knew I knew I had to make decisions. I, I had to do something. I had to, you know, that this... What had happened at that period, Andy, was anger took over. I believed, I truly believed at that time that the gods or the the devils of, you know, past centuries, something had happened, you know, and my mind went, I, I became insane and I thought everything I touched or everything I was going to die and I was in a really, really bad place and, and anger took over and I remember I used to stand in a pub and I would um, stand at the bar drinking shots and, and waiting, hoping somebody would bump into me, you know, um, and I would start fights. And I would go in, and, and, and I was talking about this yesterday as well, about self-harming. We all have different aspects of self-harming. I, I remember I used to go into pubs, and I used to deliberately look for gangs of people, men, if there was four or five or more, and go in and pick a fight. And I remember many times I used to wake up with a broken nose, cut lip, broken hand, blood everywhere, and I had no idea what I'd done. And, and that was a frightening, frightening place to be. And um, I knew I had to do something. So I moved. I moved away to another town. Started, I had to start a whole fresh. I moved away to another town. Got myself a place to live. And, and, and what happened was the child abuse started to surface. This had never happened to this extent. And I started feeling ashamed. And, and I started taking amphetamines in massive, massive quantities. I mean, massive quantities uh, and, and massive quantities of vodka. 
and what happened was that uh, I, I arranged with the doctor. <coughs> I was I was going to get a weekly script. I changed my script to antipsychotic medication, and I was determined. But all of a sudden, I remember the door got kicked in, and it was the police. And the police come in, and and they seen up in the roof and the ceiling there was two lights, but one of the lights on the other side had completely caved in. Oh, the cement was down where I'd obviously tried to hang myself. And all over the floor there was empty vodka bottles and cigarette packets and all the rest of it. And again, I was taken into the mental hospital uh, sections. And um, yeah, this was a this was a serious breakdown. And and I remember I remember sitting in a room, sitting in this room, and there was sort of four or five people on a, in chairs, a psychotherapist, psychoanalyst, psycho this and psycho that. And and the, the guy said to me, he said, listen, he says, eh, you know, you you you've been through a lot, mate. You've you've been through quite a bit. You you, you, you we're going to have to, you know, it's going to be here for a while. You know, this the stuff that you've been through, it, it's <laughs> a lot more than a lot of people can take. And and then all of a sudden they started talking about, they said, look, we've got your medical records here. We, we, we know you were abused as a child. You know, we, we've always known it. And people have tried to talk to you about it and it's been very, very difficult. And, uh, and then I opened up about the murder and I opened up about a lot of other things. And then they started to tell me, they said, did, did you know that, that you had... Um, Apparently one time in Northampton, I had, um, in the main car park in the city centre, or the town centre, I'd got a rope and tied it around my neck and tied it up to a lamppost. And they cut, they shut the whole town centre down. To, and, and I had no memory of this. I had no memory at all because I, I was just so much in, in, in addiction. And another time I knew that at the railway bridge, I jumped off the railway bridge to, onto the track and I broke my leg. I knew that one and I rolled over. And I was taken back in, you know, in the hospital. But I was surprised about the amount of overdoses I'd done. You know, seven, eight, nine overdoses. And I couldn't tell which one was uh, an overdose and which one was a cry for help. But we sat and, and, and I said to him, I said, listen, just do me one favour. Please don't medicate me. Let, let, let's let's talk about this. Let, let's try talking way through this instead of sticking like back to up Mars. Sorry, excuse me, my backside which they'd done for years, so many, many times. I'd gone in into these mental hospitals and well, all over Britain, all Sheffield. I'd moved from town to town. I couldn't keep still. I'd end up in the mental hospitals and, and they would just lie back to you, you know, for days and days at a time. And, uh, yeah, and, and I said, let's, let, let's talk about this. I'm ready. I want to change my life around. And, and I remember going back to my, my, my room now, I see I was sectioned off at this time because I couldn't talk to you. I, I was still full of anger. I still I wanted to kill everybody. You know, it was just I was just not a nice person. And I remember going back to my room and and, it, and that night I prayed. I did something I'd never done in my life, obviously because my relationship with the church wasn't as such. And I, and I prayed and I said to God, "If you're there," I said, "My God, I, I need your help." And what happened in the morning is when I woke up, I woke up and all of a sudden. <laughs> I started, I thought, what's happened to my asthma? And my stomach ulcers, you know, up to that point, I took stomach stomach ulcer medication for most of my adult life. I thought, what's going on here? And I remember picking a fag up and going to the window to have a fag, and I couldn't, you know, and I put it down, and I've never, ever touched another cigarette or a joint since, never, never to, and I never touched another uh, medic stomach tablet. I think it was Ativan. What was I on? I forget what I was on. But I'd gone through so many different stomach ulcers things. And, um, yeah, I, I never took another one. And I remember I got up and I walked out and, and I bumped into one of the doctors, Dr. Bart, B-A-A-K, a, a South African guy. And I said to him, I said, something's happened to me. I said, I, I, don't, I don't know what's happened. I said, I just feel different. I said, I, got, I, I prayed last night. Uh, and he said, oh, he says, uh, you've been born again. I thought, right, what does that mean? <laughs> he said, well, your life's going to change. And the first thing I said, because I had no idea what it was, I said, does this mean I'll get more brew money? More dough more do money? And he laughed, he says, no, he says, but your life's going to change in a big way. And I thought, okay, okay. So we went to church and we prayed. And I had this urge. 
I just had this urge to help people, to, to, to be kind, to be nice to people. And, and I couldn't stop making people cups of tea and just running to the shop and getting biscuits. I, I just had this new vibe, this new appetite, this new vision, this new life. Something had happened that just cleansed me right out. And, um, w- within weeks, within weeks, I was released. And, uh, I wanted to tell the world. I, I couldn't understand what had happened to me. And, uh, but I knew I had to sort of learn. I had to pick up things because I had so much to learn about life, about myself. And, and, and I started, um, I started enlisting, finding self-help courses, things like, uh, REBT. You know, I'd look for evening classes, sort of 10 miles away or whatever, and I'd enlist. And, and when I got there, I'd find there were people there who were, were on work programs, you know, or career paths. But I wasn't there for anything like that. I, I was there to help myself. I wanted to get a better understanding of, of my mental health, you know, the, you know, the personality disorders, you know, I don't think there was one that I didn't have. And I wanted to get a better, so I self-taught myself, you know, whether it was REBT or just CBT. Uh, I remember once going to, I think it was Oxford's, and it was an evening class, but it was a two and a half hour journey. But when I got there, I missed the last bus. So what I did was, I took a sleeping bag with me, and a, and a tarpaulin, and I'd go every week, and I'd go there, and I very quickly became the guinea pig. The people said that this guy's been every through everything that we're talking about, but and I'd tell them about my life. But what they didn't know was that night when I left, I'd jump over a wall to the railway station and I'd fall asleep there, and then in the morning I'd get the bus back home, which I thought was quite amusing. Well, that's about um, you feeling safe being outside, yeah. and it amazed me that because I probably never looked at it that way. You know, I mean, most people think well. I need some help, so refer me to a group that will help me. But then if you look at it in reverse, if you could be taught the same thing um, on a college course or a college, you know, education, wouldn't that be amazing? But what amazed me more was, yeah, not so much the course, although that was good, you slept there because you felt it was so important to learn learn Mm -hmm. what what you learned, and I was on a mission. I know people um, have different views of God, but trust me, um, I'm not religious, you know, in, in the sense of I don't go to church, but I do pray and Christ, you know, whoever he is out there, he's magic. He does help you. And, oh, yeah. and I, think, I think the more you pour your heart out in prayer, the quicker the response will be. I mean, he's not stupid either. He's not going to give you money um, unless you're entitled to it. But he'll help you deal with the problems of today and then you don't have to worry about tomorrow until it comes. But it's amazing. That's, the, that's exactly what happened. You're exactly right. Because what happened to me was I started talking about what had happened to me, but I wasn't coming across right. And I was trying to pray to God, you know, what is it? Where, where am I going? What, what is this all about? Why have I gone through all this? There must be a reason for it. And God said to me, he said, listen, you must stop and learn to listen. So I went up to Scotland, the Highland of Scotland, and, and I, I applied for and I got accepted into a theology college. So I did a, a year's access course in a theology college um, up in, in, near Inverness. Uh, uh, and and I, learned, I learned how to listen. I learned how to understand. I learned how to follow what Jesus Christ was trying to tell us and what he's trying to show us is a way to live, the only way to live. And I tried to be the best person I could be and put my past behind me. And uh, uh, this is this is this is what I say to people, that there's two Dave Sharps. There, there's the Dave Sharp before my wife died, which is, some people would say criminal, bad, whatever you are. I would say sick and, and troubled. But all of a sudden... I'm finding this whole new life. And God says, you must go to theology college and learn. Learn the Bible and learn to listen to my words. So that's what I did. And at night time, I would go to Inverness with the homeless charities. 
and and I would watch and listen and learn about homelessness and how they deal with it. And I, I found I could I could find people in places where no one else would look. And this is what we call the dark world. And this is where I lived for all those years because you've got to remember, I keep saying, you have to remember when you talk about self-help, I couldn't go to college because I had this dark secret, Andy, and it's been with me all my life. You know, I've been on my own my whole life. Although I've had all these relationships, this thing, this dark secret, you know, which, which by the way, thousands of people, how many survivors have you, you heard say that they were threatened into silence? You know, thousands of them. Mm. So, th- so this is this is what I'm trying to explain. What what, what happens? What, what what happens to somebody that's, that's been through that? This affects every aspect of your life, every relationship. So you have to go down this route of self help, because, yeah, I mean, I, I remember I did. I, I think I did enlist in a tertiary, tertiary college, and I lasted a couple of weeks because it was very similar to later on in my life. Whenever whenever I tried to get a job and I, and I tried to get in call centres. Because I always found that, I mean, you couldn't put me in a room with three or four people. I would stick out a mile. I've got CPTSD. I talk a lot. And I talk about one subject. You know, I, I, I would, I would, so what I had to do is I had to find jobs in places like Batley Cards, in that West, the call centres, where when you went for the, the, the recruitment, they were looking for 20 or 30 or 40 people at a time. So I could fit in, just sneak in. Because nine times out of ten, Andy, when when you went through the interview process, I could, I was going to swear there, I don't know the alternative to B-U-L, I could blank my way through any interview. I'll have them in tears. You know, I'll, I'll make up stories and, and they won't, you know, because I had to lie. But then when, when you go into the process after that, where you go into the training camp, where you've got 20 or 30 people there, and you've got these two trainers... And then you're going to do a week's training where what happens is they want to get to know you whilst teaching you how to do the job. And a and hundred times out of a hundred, they say, right, let's have, what we'll do is we'll have you up one at a time. Tell us a bit about yourself. And, you know, you're not bringing in that and, and get to know each other. Well, I couldn't get up and stand up and say, my name's Dave Sharp. I'm a survivor of historical child abuse. I suffered the most horrific child sex abuse and I don't want to get close to any of these because I'm carrying a dark secret. So a lot of the time when I got these jobs, see the night before, I would get on my knees and pray. I say, God, Father, forgive me. Because see, tomorrow I'm going to lie my... off. I'm going to have to lie my way through this because I couldn't... I couldn't... I couldn't get the job otherwise. You know, you imagine if you said that, you would be right in the corner, sticking out. And nine times out of ten, when I did get a job, I never lasted more than a couple of weeks because I did stick out. I did. Here's the thing as well. What, what, what's the first thing? When you get a job, especially if you're Scottish and you're moving in England, say, and you meet another Scots fella, the fella says, where do you come from? You tell him. The, the second question is always the same. What school did you go to? You know? So I had to avoid that. So already I've put myself at a disadvantage and, uh, by lying. So therefore I'm always going to be playing catch up because I've always got to remember that lie to cover the next lie, to cover the next lie, to cover the next lie while I was trying to learn a new job. It was ju- I couldn't do it. It was useless. So I gave up. You know, it was really, really difficult. I've had more jobs and I've lived in more towns and more cities trying to get that relationship with people, any relationship, but whenever people, my biggest enemy was always the nicest people. Whenever people try to be nice to me, I push them away. And I've done that most of my life. But as I say, what happened then was, when you talk about Brazil, I was at church. And uh, the pastor came up to me and says, Dave, he says, uh, we're, we're doing a project. We, we, we want you and somebody else. We, we, we want you to go to Brazil with the Assemblies of God. He said that there's there's a project out there where it's a it's a Christian community where they go out into Sao Paulo and they look for homeless people and they take them in and they rehabilitate them and if they're children they reconnect them with their parents and if they're parents they reconnect them with their children if they can and everybody comes together and we build a house for them and they become part of the community. So I went out there. And it was just, it was an experience, even before I went to Brazil, 
I felt like God was saying to me, you need to get ready for this. This is going to be a life-changing experience for you. You're going to learn so much. And one of the, one of the biggest things I learned, even before I even talk about it, was I learned that all my life, I'd been playing the victim card, you know. Whereas when I went to Brazil, I, I, I met people who had, didn't have any underwear, didn't have any shoes or socks, lived in these favelas, and loved, loved God, and loved each other. And they would do anything for each other. And, and, and I remember even when I went there, the first day I went there, Andy, uh, and this guy came up to me and he says, can you leave your shoes outside your door? I said, what do you mean? He said, leave your shoes outside your door. I, I, I'd like to wash them for you. I said, well, no, you know, they're, they're, they're brand new. I just bought them. I bought them just last week in Scotland. No, no, I, I washed them for you. And, I, and then I found out that he's the pastor. And the pastor wants to wash my shoes every night. I thought, my God, that's amazing. And someone else came up to me and said, can you leave the towel out at night time after you finish? I'll, I'll wash the towel and it'll be dry for you in the morning. I thought, wow, and, and uh, this is the first day. I thought, my God. And, and, and I experienced love in, in, in a way that I've never experienced in my life. It, it, it was just, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing, Andrew. Yeah, <laughs> I, I went to Brazil as well. Um, obviously as a tourist but I saw the <clears throat> what I call them shanty towns I saw the shanty towns and, Cabalas um, yeah Cabalas and I, I, I went into this Cabala Fabala F-A-B oh sorry Fab yeah. <laughs> I, I, I call them shanty town then <laughs> yeah 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 I went, went into the poor area and I wasn't gonna go in there I thought now nah, um they tell you not to go in them, you know. The tourist says buy a proper guide, but saw this boy eventually. We and then anyway, I saw poverty and its worst kind. But you know what? Mm -hmm. I think you've mentioned it already to me, if not just a minute ago as well. They're so happy having nothing. I oh, couldn't yeah, believe absolutely. it. I couldn't believe it. And I, at the end, you know, we had a tour and give him 10, 10 pounds. And he, he said, my friend, this will feed our family for a long time. And I thought, yeah. God bless him. And I, I, I did ask him, what keeps you going? He said, smiling mm. and God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It, yeah, absolutely. He, he was saying it in an abbreviation. Um, yeah. Basically, it's the opposite of sad, smiling and God. You yeah. don't want to be sad. You want to be happy. So yeah. you keep smiling. Pray to God. Yeah. Um, when, when they go to church, Andy, it's four hours for a service. And nobody blinks. You know, when you go to church here, after 10 minutes, people are looking at the clock. Oh, come on, hurry up. I've got a chicken in the oven, you know. But over there, it's like, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just total commitment. I, I remember once uh, I was in... You know, I, I, I went on the radio. They asked me to give a testimony on the radio. And it had an audience of five million people. And it just blew me away. I was, I, I was obviously, I couldn't speak Portuguese then. I can speak a bit now, but not much. But I've been, I've been back sort of a couple of times since, so my, my Portuguese got better. But I, I remember this time I was in the favelas and I was giving my testimony in this church. And it had no roof. Just, just breeze blocks. And, and the, all around, there was, these people had no water, no gas, no electricity. And I remember saying to the pastor, I said, well, how are you going to build? Is it confidante? Faith. Faith. That they knew God would provide if you only believe. If you have faith, God will do anything. And I was giving my testimony, and all of a sudden a helicopter pulled up outside. And I thought, oh yeah, maybe sort of a, must be somebody important, politician or something coming to speak. Okay. And then, and then, the church finished, and then the, the people who, who took me in, said, right, Dave, come on, we're going. I said, what, what, that's for me. He says, yeah, we're going to the next gig. We've got, we've got a, there's an all-day Christian festival in Santos or somewhere. I said, well, I'm going in a helicopter. I said, my God, I said, before, two weeks ago, or before I came on the plane, I never even got on a bus. <laughs> All of a sudden, my life's just getting transformed, just so much, just, just by believing in God. And then the next minute I'm up in this helicopter 
and we, we passed over this field, and I remember looking down, and I said to my mate, the pastor, I said, God, look at all those people there. I said, there must be at least 10,000 people there. He said, no, Dave, he said, there's nearly 100,000 people there. He said, and that's where we're going. He said, you're one of the guest speakers. I went, what? So the, the helicopter pulled in, and they had this big stage, and there was about eight or ten people there, ministers and pastors and singers and what have you. Kleber Lucas, my, my favourite, he's a Brazilian, he's a Christian singer who, who sings about Jesus the way Lionel Richie sings about women. He's just, I met him in a shopping centre once as well, and it was just, uh, just oh, it was just a, an amazing guy. I've got his CDs and everything, he's fun. I don't understand the language, but just he's just so passionate about God the way he sings and about Jesus. But anyway, uh, I, I, I'm there. And I've got a pair of white shorts on, or white trousers, but it's like cheesecloth. So, and you don't wear underpants because it's too hot. It was 100 and plus degrees. And I've got this white t-shirt and, and I'm sitting there and I'm sort of number three or four to speak. And I'm looking out and there's just nearly 100,000 people there. And I'm like, wow, my God, this is incredible. And then it came to my turn and I had my Bible with me, but I stood up and you could see everything. Because <laughs> so, I was sweating. And I had to put the Bible down and, and I flustered over to the, 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 pu- the, I forget what you call it, the, the podium. And, and I gave my testimony. It took sort of over two hours. And again, with a translator. But, um, it was the most exhilarating, amazing experience. And, and then a couple of weeks later, we, we were in a meeting and they were, they were talking about, they wanted to do, I, um, a march against the Catholic Church in, I think it was Santos or Sao Paulo, I'm not sure, and they wanted me to join it. I said, yeah, of course, I'd love to come. Yeah, absolutely. And we went, and there was thousands upon thousands of people at this march. And and the one thing that stuck out to me, and this is what changed, this is what the turning point of my life was. I, I remember the, all the nuns, everybody, lot, thousands of people. But what stuck out, Andy, was the amount of Scotland flags and I, I thought, my God, look at that. How many Scottish people? And I remember I, I actually, I went over to a nun. She was a lot, lot younger than me and she was a Scottish woman. And we spoke, we sat down and we broke bread during a break and we were chatting. And uh, yeah, she told me about her experiences of the Catholic Church and I gave her my bus stop testimony, which is 30 seconds, which, believe it or not, I can do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, she, she, she was there for the same reasons as us. Uh, and it was incredible. Something you wouldn't see in Scotland. You, you, you wouldn't see that in Scotland, you know. So when I came back, I knew, I, I knew, and I, I knew that God was saying to me, something big, something very big is going to happen in Scotland. And, and you're going to be part of it. You have to be patient and you have to learn to listen, which is difficult for me. But I still firmly believe that, that something big is going to happen. Yeah, uh, I, I truly believe something big is going to happen and I'm going to be involved in it. It is well known um, because, well, because I I know it's well known. If one person prays for something good to happen, and it mm-hmm. works the, the other way as well if you're a bad person, if you get one person to pray for a bad thing. But if you mm-hmm. get 10 people and 100 people and 10,000 people, 100,000 people... Or to pray for something good to happen, it generally happens. Um, yeah, yep. we're, <clears throat> we're going on. Um, I want to comment. These are your own words, not mine. Um, is to Dave Sharps, the survivor, the campaigner. Um, and I like these things you you wrote before. When I was sixteen, I visited the doctor. We've talked about this and told him I'd been abused in care. He gave me a script that started twenty five years of addiction. Two weeks after, sorry, two weeks ago, age 60, I went to a doctor and told him I was having flashbacks and he reached for his script pad. Noah said, you people need to learn to talk. And then the campaigner, some people call me a troublemaker, but those who seek truth and justice thank me for exposing them people who trample over the graves of all those children who lives were taken or lost because of child abuse in Scotland for their own personal gain, truth over fear. Mhm, mhm. Yep, yep. It's absolutely true. It's um, here's the thing, Andy. You talk about revolving doors again. That there is this system that's gone on for years that um, survivors do go through. 
prison addiction, mental health hospitals, and, and, and then you know, and, and I spoke to a lot of street workers. I've still I spoke to a lot of people who say, you know, in the system in Scotland, they're told anybody talks about child sex abuse, refer them to the GP. And nine times out of ten, that's a road in, down addiction. We all know that. Because there's nothing else there for them. And this has been going on for years and years and years, you know. But getting back to my own campaign, you know, when I, when I, when I left hospital, when I started turning my life around, one of the first things I had to do was to contact the police, which I did. And, and, and by that stage, I'd, I'd, I'd known and I started thinking, all those people I'd met throughout the country, Scottish people, in London, Manchester, Liverpool, all these places where I'd been, Aberdeen, living, uh, Inverness, that told me that they'd been abused in childhood. It's, it started to hit me and realise that something was going on. And when I called the police, the police laughed in my face. You know? And, and I knew then, I said, no, no, I'm not going to accept this. And, and this is when I started. I started going down to London. I started going to Manchester. Anywhere there, there was a campaign going on, I went. You know, this is 2000, 2001, 2002. And I started, you know, I know we've only got half an hour left in our, in our conversation, so I'll try and speed things up. I started campaigning and meeting more and more Scottish people. I started venturing into Scotland and meeting people. I moved back up, as I say, after I went to Brazil, I moved back up to Scotland with the, sorry, the college, theology college. And then I moved to Livingston and I started meeting other people. And then we started noticing that, that more and more people were coming forward. And, and, and then we came, we came to the, the period in 2004, which is probably one of the most important periods in the history of child abuse in Scotland. It's the time, the, the now what we call now the famous speech by Jack O'Connell. You know, in, in 2004, you know, Jack O'Connell was, McConnell was the first minister. And, and he came out and stood up in Parliament. He says, I, I apologise on behalf of all the people of Scotland for all the child abuse suffered in our country. Now, people people say, p- people don't stop and say, why did he do that at that time? Well, the reason he did it at that time, Andrew, was because there was such a big movement. Things were really, really starting to take off. But what he did in that moment, and what a lot of us people think did intentionally, was he took all the guilt and the shame away from the people of Scotland. And what, what happened at that moment, a lot of the campaigners, a lot of them who weren't survivors, but actual, you know, concerned campaigners, they dropped off. And, and, and we've never got that back since. We've never been able to get that movement back since. You know, we, you, you, you very seldom find any campaign groups now in Scotland, anything to do with child abuse, as, as I say. It, 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 no, nobody talks about it. I think it's been deliberate um, conquer and divide. Um, is, is that the way you put it? Yeah, they absolutely. They try to div- divide people, um, either make them think they're satisfied or basically divide them because too many people getting together and speaking as one is, well, it, that's what they don't want. I know that. Well, um, child uh, again, campaigns in London. Yeah, again as well, we've got to remember, I mean, there's a couple of moments now in, in recent months and so Lady Smith is now starting to have her own voice, which she never has before. She's made two very important statements. One of them, as I said, that she said that for 13 years before the child abuse uh, uh, inquiry started, this government did everything they could to stop the inquiry. And, and I, I trust me, I was in the middle of it. I was in the thick of it. False accusations and people, you know, people getting paid off. All the, all the things you hear... You know, you don't believe happened, you know. But at the same time, I had this thing with the police as well. You know, I often refer to the, the campaign with um, Hillsborough. You know, when the Hillsborough campaign, the, the, the people that did that, what happened then is the police infiltrated the Hillsborough campaign groups and, and they, 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 they sought the most gullible people, usually the biggest and the thickest, and they got them to infiltrate. Well, that happened in Scotland as well. Trust me, I was a, I was a victim of it. You know, but what also happened as well is Lady Smith, a few months ago, she came out and made a statement. She says, for the last 50 years, the people of Scotland ignored their children. The people of Scotland knew what we suffered. The social services, police, nobody did anything about it. 
We were left in these places, thousands upon thousands of us. And as I say, these people were allowed to manipulate, abuse and threaten not only us, but our families and our communities. And again, Scotland has never learned how to deal with that. We've never learned how to face up to that shame or that guilt, you know? And, 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 (coughs) sorry. Yeah, what you basically are saying um, is is another quote from yourself. Now, I only do your quotes because I'm no good at them. Um, Scotland survivors are being ignored by the political establishment. They're dominated by the political activists and ripped off um, morally by the corrupt lawyers. Come forward, be brave, don't take your abuse to the grave. And uh, as we we said, the um, police are changing over the years. Their attitude against child abuse is different, um, hopefully for the better, but I doubt it. Um, I do know young young police now. Anyone under probably 35, 40, they're the ones really to avoid. The older police, and I think that they're good. They still believe in justice for survivors. That's my... Um, based on, you know, what I've learned and what I've taught. Police service. Uh, police services throughout Britain over the last 25, 30 years have lost a lot of good, moralistic, uh, non-judgmental, um, dedicated police officers. And they've been replaced by these young kids who, I, 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 I don't quote me, I don't know the actual figures, but something, you know, they, they receive sort of a year or 18 months training and then they're straight on the streets. I've experienced that myself. I've seen it, you know, policing's changed. When I was doing my campaign and a lot of people would come up and say, I don't trust the police. And we would say, I would say things like, come on, reporting's changed, attitude's changed, you know, uh, resources have changed. And, and trying, I was trying to get people to see that the policing had changed. And, and there is a lot of good police officers in Scotland in, in the child abuse unit. But I, I, I'm afraid to say that policing in general... You know, we, we've seen this with multiple examples. And again, I'm always very, very careful because my job, I think, is to try and encourage people to come forward. That's what I've always tried to do. But uh, again, with the, and, and I'm going to speed this up a bit, with, with the child abuse inquiry, m- more and more we're hearing sort of stories. Uh, again, we, we had lots of experiences where people were being abandoned, people were being ignored, people were being, having their, uh, their, um, appointments cancelled uh, and we found there was a pattern there because there was certain people who had come forward mentioned paedophile rings and things like that who wouldn't be uh, allowed to give their statement or they gave their statement and never had so a lot of suspicions were starting to happen way but also again and this is what we're talking about at the end of Andy is the awareness campaign there was and never, never has been there never has been an awareness campaign for the child abuse inquiry and now we're seeing the same thing with the redress scheme you know, we if you phone up now, and we did it, we did it this year. I was doing a documentary with a London firm who, who were doing a thing on the English Public Inquiry. They contacted me and wanted to get my views, also the comparisons between England and Scotland. And I said, contact the Child Abuse Inquiry and ask them two questions. Ask them how many people have come forward and how much they've spent on raising awareness. Well, first thing they won't tell you. You have to dig deep. And, and, and believe me, this will all come out. This will all come out. I, I don't like to get personal. And again, I've made a point tonight. I've, I've promised myself I'm not going to get personal with anybody. But here's the thing, Andy, and, and I do really, really have to say this. For a, since the public inquiry said started, a lot of us have said that when John Sweeney opens his mouth, a lot of us are saying that's going to come back and bite you. Now, the proof is in the fact that if you actually look and go back and see how many times he's actually apologised to survivors, you'll see... Why has he had to do that? Why does he keep apologising? Because he's coming unstuck, you know? And, and the public inquiry now is just dragging its feet, you know? It's got seven, 74 or something care homes still to go through. And there's no, there's no awareness campaign. And as I say, what we're seeing now, this is rolling on into the redress scheme where people are now getting concerned because... There's nothing. If you look through this bill, some of this stuff, the, the, the money that they're spending, and again, where are the money's going? But there's nothing going on raising awareness. Why is that? Because they want to save money. If you look at this bill that is right in front of me now, this is the one that's causing all this thing now. The Scottish government have done what they call central projections, and they've devised this predicted list 
of how many people they expect to come forward. I got given this by a reporter and said, Dave, this is quite concerning. If the Scottish government's estimations are right, they only anticipate less than 400 people are going to get the maximum pain out of £100,000. Seriously? Seriously? Wow. We, again, everybody wants to ask the question, how many people have actually come forward? Or how many people, sorry, how many people have actually been abused, sexually abused? It's tens and tens of thousands. But this doesn't say anything. What happened to Scotland, God's country? What happened to the country who always put the children first? You know, what happened to, we will do whatever it takes to look for and find every survivor out there. So this is why now what we're saying is me, my, my campaign group SAFE, we started in 2017 when I was awarded compensation. On the day the public inquiry started, I stood outside the inquiry with a group of survivors and we started SAFE. In that time, since before the pandemic, we were on the streets of Edinburgh, Aber uh, Dundee, Glasgow, Greenock, Kilmarnock, Stirling. We went into gay pride, walked for suicide. We've, we've talked to thousands of survivors and family members. We, we know more than anybody else. I mean, the back of 2018, people were telling me, you've got to be very careful, Dave. I said, why is that? He said, you're showing the Scottish government up. He said, today, it is in 2018, the Scottish government have spent 25 million and sort of less than three or four hundred people have come forward. But you're doing this campaign with your own money. We get no funding off anybody. But yet we're getting hundreds of people come forward telling us they're abused. And we're trying to refer them to the public inquiry, to the police, places like Future Pathways, you know. And we were very, very, very successful. <coughs> and, and so we, we, we know the numbers. Everybody knows the numbers. And what we're saying now is when we're looking at this, I mean, I, 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 it may be hard for, pe for people to grasp this and, and you know I'll try and do it in layman's terms so that everybody can understand the Scottish government are predicting less than 8,000 people will come forward now the, the, there's, there's two there's two levels of payments there's a fixed rate payment which is the fixed rate redress which is £10,000 which they want to give to everybody who, who was in care right now then it goes so, on to level sorry, sorry Dave um, interrupt you this is an important point a lot of people, even I don't know the answer, are asking, do you get that 10000 anyway, or is it 10000 or claim a bigger amount, or do you get the ten grand anyway? Well, this is what they're saying. You're, you're going to have to, like, as I said a minute ago with this bit I showed you, you're going to have to prove the, the, the level of abuse you suffered. Now, they're saying here they're going to do everything they can to help you, but what, what, uh, there's no indication here. You know, they're referring everybody to... Um, Birthlink. Birthlink, where hmm. you'll get your records of entry. I mean, do you think do you think the Catholic Church or the Christian Brothers or uh, Quarriers or any of these other... Do you think they're just going to hand over all the records to, to Birthlink? Of course they're not, you know? But as I say here, if, if you look at this, the fixed rate payment, £10,000, 1,200 pe people, they think, will come, come forward... Now, the individually assessed payments, level one is 20,000, level two is 40,000, level three is 60,000, level four is 80,000, level five is 100,000. Now, they've got a, this disgusting spreadsheet in front of me of their central projections where they think at level one, the 20,000, 35% of the 8,000 people, which, rep which is 2,800, We'll get the twenty thousand. Watch how it goes down, Andrew, as the as the figures get higher. Thirty percent will get the forty thousand. Ten percent will get the sixty thousand. Five percent will get the eighty thousand, and five percent will get the hundred thousand. Now that's a total cost of two hundred and eighty-four million pounds. Did you remember earlier on when I said to you about what we think the overall cost would be if all the survivors were to come forward? Eight hundred something billion, seven seven hundred and fifty million, something million. like that. Yeah, yeah. Do you, can you see the, the savings they're making? It's all about money. This yeah, is I'm, why I don't think you've answered the question, which is not um, a pro problem. I mean, they're, they're well, not making it clear whether you get the ten thousand pound and run, as in walk away, don't bother anymore. You're happy, 
or you get the 10,000 plus you can do an individual payment that they actually can't answer that question. I, I wrote to John Swinney and he, and he avoided it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And here's the thing. I haven't got the answer, but what I can do is, and what we can do, people say to me, hang on, be careful, you're going out there. I'm, what I'm saying to people is, we're going to go on the streets. We're going to get 5,000 copies done, and we're going to say to the people, we don't have the answers about the waiver. But what we're telling you is, when you go forward, make sure you make uh, you get the right answers. You know, there's a lot of people there that will be happy with 10,000. You know, t- t- that, that, that's going some way to get closure. You know, that that's the very minimum. You know, and, and I can't say to somebody... You know, you're going to get 80,000 or you're going to get 100,000 because we've got no idea what, what efforts they're putting in to look for the records. We, we don't know. We have no understanding. Uh, but what we do know is the minimum effort here has been made to look for all the survivors. That's a clear indication, Andy, that this is not all right. This, this, no. is, this, this is all wrong. This is, you know, again, I'll say this and I have to say it. The Scottish government has done nothing here to raise awareness and this will drag on. It's a four-year contract. This will drag on and drag on at minimum. You know, but back in 2012, when I started campaigning, I, I remember I very quickly got progressed up to... I, I ended up sitting in the seats with the government, with these other survivor groups, and I learnt very, very quickly what they're very, very good at is getting negative information out. Because negative inform- information stops people coming forward. And I remember I used to get phone calls from reporters saying, Dave, can you get us some good stories so that we can start raising awareness of this public inquiry? And it was very, very difficult. And it still is. It still is. That's, again, why I'm saying what we need is the public to come out and start talking. The public to come out and people who genuinely, genuinely, if you really, really care for these people, you know, it's and it's affecting all our children now. Children are coming out of care, more children in prison, more children in addiction, prisons. You know, this is a national crisis. Yeah, this is I, a... Can I, sorry, um, interrupt again. Rather than us rushing this, I mean, I'm quite happy to spend a little bit longer. We've only okay. got four or five points anyway. If listeners mm-hmm. um, just stay tuned in, we'll be done about the quarter past the hour. Whenever we finish our bits and pieces... Because there is a couple of very important points now. Okay, okay. The, um, so I'm going to comment what you've said already. Um, it, it's ridiculous what they're doing. I mean, I've been raped. I mean, this is what they're saying, you know. He's been raped once, but she's been raped twice. Well, put them in the 20 gram bracket, them in the 40 gram bracket. But they've had multiple rapes. Put them in the... Un- it's not fair the way they're doing this. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's that point do they realise that it's not about the sexual abuse they've experienced in the care homes we're talking about the government now it's about the lifelong trauma Joanne hasn't Mm -hmm. worked a day in her life she's Mm -hmm. never been to college a day in her life she wanted, she's got a, a mild learning disability they don't want to know her because she's having drugs um, and I'm passionate I'm not angry, of course I'm not I have to fight people every day for her. Um, I just want other people out there just to know one little thing. You're not alone. Um, Mm -hmm. And we can do this with Dave Sharp and the Safe Campaign. He's more of a... You're more of a model, aren't you? Um, Not a model, what they call it. You you set an example. And if others Mm -hmm. followed your ideas and example... um, I love this idea. It's something that me and another survivor went to John Swinney about it. It's a national helpline for survivors. And and what the idea is, you get somebody who triages you um, from a volunteer helpline. They're a survivor. And they triage you into the proper organisations. That's the idea we had. John Swinney said, his own words were, and it was minuted at that meeting, something along the lines, well, I never... I never thought of that, nor did my team. Let's look mm-hmm. into this. That sounds yep. very promising. We need a yep. 24-hour helpline, Dave. We need the national voice. You know, we need politicians, police, yep. charities. Let's all sit down through a table. Let's make it, you know, a bit like the government, a, a, you know, a, a regional meeting once every couple of months, local meetings every week or fortnight, and let's thrash this problem out. The Scottish yep. people will, you know, if you're a government and you're losing a bit of 
votes, this is a good way of getting yeah. votes back. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and I don't mean to be disrespectful. When I, when I say the only way we can deal with this issue is to take the responsibility away from the politicians, what I'm saying is that, you know, that, that you've just proved it, you know, that, that, that they, they don't have the answers to this problem. So what we have to do is we have to sit down, as you say, with the right men. People say to me, what is it you want? What, what, how, how are we going to do this? And I'm just exact same. You, you, we've all got the same dream. I've got this, this it's called the, 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 the Tree of Hearts which, you know, represents so many different ideas and dreams of, of various campaigns and institutions. But here's mine. Here's mine. If we had a 24-hour helpline... Now, we know just recently that the Scottish government have shut down homeless centres because they didn't work. You know, the Belgrove Hotel and others, you know, with the children, the children in there fixing up and dying. I've been in it. You know, I've seen it. it. It doesn't work. And, and here's the thing. If something doesn't work, either go in and fix it or shut it down. So the, there's no money. You know, even before the pandemic, child abuse charities, there's seven or eight child abuse charities. And there's, there's roughly a million pounds or something like that was invested into it. They've all got to fight over this money. It's, it's terrible. It's just because, again, conquer and divide, but also give them the minimum resources to stop more people coming forward. That, that's a fact. Because if it wasn't a fact, we would see a different attitude. But there isn't, the, the attitude's not there. The desire's not there. The, the, the want is not there. So people just have to cling on to what they've got. So if we had a, if we had a 24 helpline, if, if you take my case, for example, very quickly, Dave Sharp, in care, abused, addiction, bereavement, alcoholism, whatever, you know, um relationship problems, if you had a, 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 a 24 helpline that sent me, how many police officers, I've, I've said this to police officers, people say to me and other people, you know when you're referring people to child abuse survivor groups or whatever, how do you know they're getting the help that you think they're going to get? They say, well, I've never thought of that. You know, if, if we knew for certain that the place you were sending them to was probably equipped to deal with the issues, we know, we, we know it's just been proved. You know, there's, there's certain places now under investigation by Oscar, you know, where mismanagement, bullying, you know, uh, financial mismanagement, all the rest of it. Because these people have never been monitored properly. So it's so easy for people to get an infiltrate. If we knew, if we had a path, we could save millions and millions. Of, I'm, I'm sure of that. We could save millions of pounds. But most importantly, the most important thing is the, 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 the hardcore. The, the core of this has to be that we don't make sure we have a system in place that no child ever has to go through what we went through. And, and I, I don't believe for a minute that can't be achieved if we had the right people and the right system. And, and forget the 750 million, we could do this for a fraction of that. But again, it's just that channel, you know, that tree of hearts where the person comes in, okay, you were abused, okay, you're in debt because of the abuse, we can send you there. Okay, you're abused, you're, it's family abuse, uh, this kind of certain type of trauma, we can send you, you know, uh, 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 call me a dreamer, call me naive, call me what you want. But I know, I know there's people out there that have the same vision, you yourself said it, you know, it's... um. But as long, as long as the people continue to ignore and deny this, the children are going to continue to be abused. It's that simple. And it is the people that can change this, not the politicians. Yeah. Uh, um, I, w I was involved in an idea which, OK, it went belly up. Um, that's all I'll say on that one. It, it didn't turn out to the way I dreamed, but I thought we could do um, the telephone helpline. I thought we could do an independent inquiry. But little did I know at the time, um, in fact, by the way, London, I think, is doing that as well as Northern Ireland, which we haven't talked about that, but it doesn't matter. That can be another show in the future. But mm -hmm. what's really, really concerning to me, my good ideas that I had at that time, I thought I got the best people that knew people that, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was the right idea. And it turned out, you know, I ended up resigning because... If, if you don't think what the survivor wants, there's no point trying to help. You have to want to help. You have to listen. You know, 
and we're not talking about just me, but police, um, social workers, the courts. We have to listen to what a survivor wants. Yeah, you know, it's all, they, the, the redress scheme promised that. Um, they're even now, so, not the redress scheme, sorry, the child abuse inquiry promised that. And now with the redress scheme, you know, people are unsure of what happens if I can't get my records? What happens mm-hmm. if this, that and the other? I mean, John Swinney recently wrote to me about Joanne, said, look, if we can't get the records, what we'll do is um, we'll do what they do in court. Um, when you you have to prove reasonable, you don't actually have to prove re- reasonable doubt, but what's that word when you have to at least have something that corroborates again with mm-hmm. your... So, mm-hmm. the, for instance, the social workers said, look, she was in Nazareth twice, Nazareth twice. The ski, sorry, the, uh, Nazareth house says you was only here once. I mean, all the other stuff she said, um, we can prove it's evidence based. Um, so John Swinney's actually said, look, you don't actually need the evidence in extreme cases, but, I think you do. I think... It, it, I mean, look at the other scheme they had. What was it called now? And uh, you know, If you're a person that's been um, harmed by a criminal mm-hmm. and, and, and it fits child abuse, but they used a the statute of limitations, didn't they? Get away with yeah. survivors. And also, I can't think of the, the, the name at the moment, but if you've been to prison or you've had um, a lot of involvement with police, then that system wasn't going to help you uh 10 grand is a lot of money for some it's not enough though um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah so anyway I'm, I'm i'm sort of digressing from one point to another mm-hmm. <laughs> okay it's okay so that, that's a redress scheme i want to know why you was camping outside a police station and i want to know you know, you know what the lies about you were being told and you explain that story because I think it was something to do with they're trying to shut you up, but that's just yeah. my opinion. When 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 we were doing safe, as I say, we were getting so many survivors coming forward, and uh, I was warned. I said, I "Told people don't like what you're doing." You know, it, uh, you know, it, it was. Uh, I was working with a survivor group who wanted to get the lawyers on board. What they very quickly realised is what we were doing was a great money earner. So instead of referring people to the public inquiry and to the police, to the future pathways, to the National Confidential Forum, they suddenly wanted to refer everybody to the lawyers. And they started turning up with their own labels. And I was so naive, I didn't understand. And then one day I was taken in a room and I was told, we've got evidence or we believe that you threatened another survivor. You have to leave. Don't talk to any survivors. Don't talk to anybody about this. And you never contact us again. I said, excuse me? Can can you show me evidence of this? Sorry, I don't understand. What what are you talking about? We don't have to show yet, but we have. Go away. And a couple of days, a week later, I got a letter saying, official, you threatened a survivor. And I couldn't believe it. And I I thought, wow, what's going on here? And then a few weeks later... They were on the streets with this new group doing the exact same things that we were doing under a new name. I thought, this is strange. And here's the thing, Andy. You know, you you can accuse me. I've been accused of a lot of things and and I've made enemies, you know, and, and, and I've been a survivor and I've had to deal with living as a survivor and it's very difficult. Living with false allegations is something so hard, I had no idea, and I couldn't drop it. I could not drop it. I just couldn't drop it, and I wouldn't give in. And even other survivor groups, chief executives, and I was meeting people. I, I was up in Edinburgh, and this I won't mention any. As I say, I'm not going to mention names. That This woman took me out to dinner and or tea, and she says, you listen to me very carefully. Everybody in Scotland knows what you're doing. You're doing a great job, and we know what's happened, and nobody believes th- these people. Y- you must believe that. I said, thanks very much. That means, and, and even police officers that I was working with, 
had said the same. Don't you give up. This, this, don't let this happen. Because what you were doing is so important. But here's the thing. To accuse me of a crime, what you're saying then is, God had already promised me, if I do things his way, you know, when I, when I became born again, Andy, when I was in the hospital, God said to me and spoke to me, he said, you do things my way, and I'll give you everything you ever needed. Not wanted, but needed. And I ended up with everything I needed. Flat, stereo, everything. And then to suddenly, to be accused, this is like, and God also said, I'll guarantee you entrance to heaven. And you'll be able to spend eternity with your wife and your child and we Joe. And I thought, wow, I've got something to live for. And I've carried that all my life ever since that happened. And to suddenly be accused of a crime, it affected me really, really badly. And and I actually attempted suicide twice. I was at Preston train station and I tried to jump in front of a train. Uh, another time I tried to set myself, I didn't try, I thought about it, set myself on fire. I couldn't handle false allegations. And I wouldn't give in. I wrote to the First Minister... I wrote to the head of police. I couldn't give in. And this person wouldn't produce the evidence, wouldn't come forward, even though she knew how much I was suffering. They, 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 they wouldn't come forward. And, it, and then they threatened me with court. And I said, well, yeah, please, I want you to take me to court. Because if you take me to court, the first thing the judge is going to say, how did this all start? And I'm going to say, over to you, where's your evidence? You have to show proof there, because it didn't happen. But what happened instead is last February, March, just before the pandemic, two police officers turned up at my door and said, you're coming with us. I said, what, what, what? Uh, you have to come to Scotland. Uh, you were taking you to Dumfries Police Station. I said, what for? We just, have, we just want to chat. You've been sending emails and, and about all this. I said, yeah, because I, I'm, I can't live with it. It's not right. This shouldn't be happening. And I said, I'm not coming with you. He said, listen, get your gear on. And the guy threatened me. You're coming with us now. I thought, oh my God, this is serious. So they drove me up to Dumfries, put me in a police station. And on the way up, I said to them, I said, listen, whatever you're going to do. He said, no, no, we're going to take you up. We're going to interview you. And we'll take you back home today. I said, listen, there's something not right here. And I knew there was something wrong, Andy. And, they, and I said to them, I said, listen, if you're going to put me in a police cell, uh, you must, you must make sure there's an appropriate adult there. You, you've got to be very, very careful what you're doing here because I suffered so much trauma as a child. And, you know, I was on drugs for many, many years and in and out of prisons. And I said, you can't put me in a police cell. Just be very, very careful what you're doing here. And then as soon as I got up to the police station, they took me in, they stripped me naked, put me in a pair of shorts, and they left me in a cell for 16 hours. And I suffer from insomnia, so I've got to use Zopiclone every night. It's something I have to do. I don't have any other medication. I don't take any drugs at all or any medication. And they wouldn't give me my medication either. And I suffered the most horrific flashbacks. And what I went through that night was horrendous. And the next morning, I was taken in a van, taken up to Aloha Court. And at 12 o'clock in the daytime, I was taken into an office with a guy. And he said, you're here because you've... Um, You've been charged with assaulting this same person. You assaulted them in April 2018. I thought, sorry, what, what are you talking that, 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 I, I don't understand. I, I don't. So I was taken to court and I was charged. And I remember the, the prosecution saying, oh, this guy in 2009, or was it 2000, or 1999, I think it was, that this man was in a fight. We think he might... Commit a, uh, and, and my, my lawyer stood up and said, what's going on here? This, this, this man's not been in any trouble for over 25 years. What, what's going on here? And eventually I got bail anyway. And then I went back to the cell and the police took my phone off me. They said, we're confiscating your phone. I said, and I thought, well, that, well hang on, that's, that's good. Once they look at my phone and they look at my emails, my text messages and everything else, They'll see. I've got nothing to hide. I'm a, I'm a complete. I'm a complete open book. I don't. I don't watch any 
illegal websites. I don't watch any porn. I don't. I'm not a member of any group, and I'm certainly not violent. And I'm sure if if I'd have done what they said I'd done, I would surely have told somebody if I'd assaulted a woman that that, that just didn't happen. And so when I went home, I had to go to my doctors and I had to get medication because the whole thing, uh, you know, uh, it was just so traumatic, Andy. It was just horrendous. I just couldn't. I was in shock. And and I waited and I waited. I thought, well, the police are going to contact me any day and say, listen, they've made a terrible mistake here. But it didn't happen. And I ended up having to go to court. And the court got adjourned because of the pandemic. And it got adjourned again. And then the lawyer phone contacted me and said, uh, there's something quite not right here. And what had also had happened is I'd been told that I had to report it to Oscar because I knew that there'd been another, uh, more more serious complaints made against this organisation. And um, the lawyers contacted me and said, listen, we, we've we heard from the Procurator Fiscal who, who want to drop this case because there's no evidence and there's other things coming up that, that show that you're innocent. Uh, he said, but you're going to have to admit to the sending menacing text messages. I said, I'm not admitting to anything. If, if this hadn't happened, or if this had been dealt with in the right way at the beginning, and it hadn't led to this, and again, this shows the way survivors are treated, worse than criminals, I would never end up in this situation. And again, Andy, this is part of my story. This is part of my history, where survivors have to go through these things. And again, as I say, we're treated worse as criminals in some aspects. You know, we have this label. Do you know, you know something? Un- something I want to share and it'll make me feel better. It'll make another survivor, male friend from the bridge of Weir, put it that way. If he's listening tonight, at the time, there was people telling me, don't trust Dave Sharp. Um, don't trust um, this person I'm mentioning from the Bridge of Weir and Dundee. Um, don't trust him because he's with Dave Sharp. They're doing this and doing that. And, of course, I was going through problems. I mean, Joanne ha- had me- mental health issues. you know. So I'm always going to deal with them. Um, and it got too much for me. And I feel bad, and I want to apologise. I started this organisation mm-hmm, <laughs> with mm-hmm. this other friend that Dave is referring to. And I just want to say, look, this wasn't our intention. It was going to be a survivor-led idea. Trouble is, it went belly up because I think I got too ambitious and I brought the wrong people in. And then people, it turned out, they're not really friends, they're trolls. And they're not one yeah. person who's been associated with these people that I'm mentioning, and they're a big media organisation um, in, in the public limelight for alternative media. Not one person has ever won their case when they've been near them. Raise my case. And here's the thing, Andy. <coughs> people say, you know, <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, and this is where I will blow my own trumpet. People actually say, thing is, when you actually sit and listen to Dave Sharp, You'll find out he's not a troublemaker. He's a troubleshooter. He's desperately trying to get everybody together. But there's people that want to break people apart, you know, and, and, and you do have to go into the swamp. And people say to me, why do you put yourself on the front line so much? And I say again, because I don't want him to suffer the way we suffered. And if people understood that more and listened to what we went through, you know, and that's why leading up to what you said about Falkirk, you know, I, I, I knew I, I knew that I had to go up there I knew, again, the way the police were acting, the way the police act, the way that survivors have been treated. I went up to Falkirk six weeks ago and I knew I was going to go up there for five days and five nights. And, and, and I wanted, I had a sign outside, stop trying to, stop trying to, uh, what was it I said again? Stop trying to silence not, survivors. Not all survivors are criminals, something like that. That one as well, I had two or three banners. Mm. And, um, yeah, it, it was basically saying that, you know, the, the, the way they treated me, you know, and, and here's the thing as well. As I say, I think I've already said this anyway. When I contacted other police officers, police officers saying to me, Dave, we, we're really, really, really sorry. We had no idea this, that you'd been arrested. We, we don't understand. Nobody understands what's going on here. And I said, well, I don't understand what I've done wrong. 
And 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 I remember, and, and this is the other thing. I was with a police officer when I was outside Falkirk. A police officer came by, a retired police officer, and he said to me, he says, "I, I, I know who you are, and blah blah blah." He said, I've, "I've asked and called about you and who who what you're all about." He said, "Can I say something?" He said, "I said I hope I don't offend you." I said, "Go on, go on." He said, "I've worked a lot with survivors." He said, "A police officer." He said, "The worst people I've ever dealt with." He said, "And please don't take this the wrong way." He said, the worst people I've ever dealt with is survivors, uh, drug addicts who were abused in childhood. He said, because they always come back. And I said, well, what does that tell you? I said, because they go through these revolving doors and every time they try and get help or justice, they're kicked down. And, and again, they're treated worse than criminals. And, and I'm no different in, in the sense that I'm a campaigner. Now, whether you're a campaigner or a survivor or a drug addict, when you're a child abuse survivor, we're in a different league. We're in the bottom league. We're, we're, we're not in the southern league. We're in the, we're in the tomato sauce league. Nobody, nobody sponsors us. Nobody supports us. Nobody backs us. Nobody believes us. Everybody doubts us. Everybody wants to put labels on us. And, and we, we have no chance. And we're an easy target. And people make money out of us. And people want to sort of get users for their own self development. And then drop us, you know, and, and again, when you get to know Dave Sharp, I'm saying, listen, if you, if we all actually sat down and listened to the hard stories and listened to what actually is happening here, you know, uh, if you don't, we, we, people are going to continue to die. These drug figures, they're, they're not going to change if you continue to ignore child sex abuse. The amount of people, these poverty... I call them political activists, because that, that's what they are. Political activists, drug awareness campaigners, Oh, they all know. They all know that they're ignoring this issue. They do, they all know it. You know, and the, the, the amount of people who I talk to and they tell me, I've not dealt with more issues. But but when, when I uncovered, when I revealed what had happened, and now this organisation is under investigation, I had people contact me saying, I do you all wrong. I'm sorry, just what you just said as well. You're not mm -hmm. the only one. A lot of people said, we've got you wrong. You know, somebody somebody said to me a while back, you're making people feel guilty for not talking about child sex abuse. And I thought, I wish you could stop and think about what you just said, you know, and it hurt me a lot at the time. But again, I don't blame the person. It's a culture. It's a culture going back decades where people have been so frightened and don't know how to deal with it. And now we have to, because it's affecting all our children now. Now the, the, the stats are facing us in the face, you know. We have to do whatever we can. The redress scheme is the last um, chance saloon. Well, it's it really, yeah. Because they're offering you compensation, counselling or trauma, whatever, paid for by them at your choice. They're offering you an apology. Well, do you get that apology from the government or from the actual establishment? Either way, it won't mean a lot, but at least they're offering it. After that, they want to sweep it away. Yeah, and because I started, <coughs> I, I wanted to talk about, and I arranged an appointment to talk about raising awareness so that we could work together. I was just so traumatised. I was so traumatised when the, when the appointment was cancelled. I actually, I actually spent all day in bed and I went into the dark world of, of, of my life, of other survivors. I, I remember, I, I, and this is what happened as well, one time, I was on the streets of Glasgow campaigning. We'd been doing three days, and an old woman came up to me, and she says, Hi, Dave. She says, my name's so-and-so. Can I talk? And I says, yeah, we'll, we'll sit down, you know, the benches at, in George's Square. And she, she said, I've heard your story and what you're doing. And she told me, she said, that her, her father had abused her. Uh, uh, and then she was put in care. The father was left at home. I don't know if he went into prison, but she was put in care. And when she came out, her mother died. And she'd been living on her own for years and years on medication. And she'd finally found the strength to come out to us. And so I, I spoke to her and, and I said, listen, why don't you come forward to the child abuse inquiry and give your testimony? She says, will you come with me? I said, of course I would. I, I would love to come with you. So... We arranged it, and she started phoning me, and and oh, I've got this fur coat my mother gave me. 
I haven't worn it in 20 years. I'm going to wear that. I'm going to get my hair done. I'm going to get new shoes. And she was a changed woman. And 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 I said, well, listen, we'll, we'll, I'll come up the night before. We'll go and have dinner, go over what's happening. And then in the morning, we'll get the train over to Edinburgh. The brother, we'd all arranged. And then uh, two days before or something, they cancelled the appointment. They cancelled our, our um, appointment to give our testimony to the, to the inquiry uh, team. And she phoned me up. And she said, you listen to me, Mr. Sharp. So it wasn't Dave anymore. You listen to me, Mr. Sharp. Don't you ever, ever contact me again. Don't you ever put survivors through that again. And I thought, oh my God, what have I done? You know, and I, I was just so hurt that this had happened to her. And it wasn't the first time it happened to other survivors as well. I thought, oh my God, what, what have I done here? And, and she hung up. And I remember I, I wrote to her a, a, and I sent her an email and I managed to talk her into meeting me at Mary Hill Shopping Centre in, in a cafe. And I remember going in and she couldn't even look at me, Andy. She couldn't even look at me. She was so angry and so hurt. And she says, I will never trust MD again. And, and, and she got up and walked out and I never saw her again. I never saw her again. And I thought, you know, wh what am I doing here? What am I, you know, th this is happening to so many people, you know, and, and, and I'm trying my best to be an example, to lead, you know, and to encourage people to come forward, have their voices heard. But this is, this, this is what we're hitting. And then all of a sudden, to have this happen to me again with the redress scheme, I, 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 I just hope that the board who did this to me, I hope they're watching and listening to this, you know, so that we can start again and sit down and say, right, you know, how can we do this? How can we come together? How can we make this work for everybody, for all the survivors? Because if they don't, we will. And I promise you, as soon as these application forms are, are printed, um, we will. And I'll use my own money. We, we'll start and we've got, we've got the plan already. We're going to start in Kamarnock. Then we're going to go up to Fife, and we're already talking to groups in the commander area to come and help us to give it, you know, because here's the thing. When you talk to people, everybody knows somebody who was abused in childhood, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so imagine if we went on the streets handing out leaflets, we could reach thousands of people. And you say to yourself, why wouldn't the government or anybody else want to encourage and help us? I've not asked for any money. I don't need the money, but it would help. If somebody would fund this scheme, it would help. But we're not asking for money. We don't need the money. We've got our own money. But we will do it. We will go on the streets and we'll campaign and we'll, we'll hand out leaflets. And we'll also hand out, we're going to hand out this bill. We want to show people, people need to read this. People need to see this is, you know, this. I've sent this to charities and campaign groups all over the world. I'm involved in over 50 campaign groups all over the world, America, Australia, you know. Um, I keep in touch with all these different child abuse campaign groups. And I sent this, and what I said to them was, please don't come back and put any negative comments on social media. Because what we're trying to do is we want to encourage people. But what I'm saying, Andrew, is people in Scotland need to read this and see, is this the way, is this really the way we're treating survivors? How can this be? How can we allow this to happen? We should be doing everything we can to reach the four corners of Scotland you, to find these people. Do you know he, he, sorry, how easy it is for them to do this? And it's very, very cheap. Now, yeah. I'll give you an example of how they could do it. The council tax bills come out in January, February for the, the new April period. Why don't they get each local authority or GP surgeries or... Um, the vaccine um, people that are vaccinating everyone put a little message on the bottom of all their letters and websites. You know, survivors come forward. The redress scheme is open. I mean, why don't the post office, even if they have to pay them, deliver a, a, a 5p leaflet to every home in Scotland to say the redress scheme is open? They don't want Andy, people to know. Uh, of the Andy, <laughs> Andy, listen to me. Listen. In 2018, a year, no, 2019, a year, two years after the child abuse inquiry started, I went undercover and I contacted a, a, a well-known Scottish reporter, Gordon Blackstock, who's won awards for his for reporting on child abuse. And I went into Glasgow. I, went, I won't mention the names of them. I went in undercover 
And I went in, and the first thing you always do, I've, I've done it in every homeless centre. I did it in Dundee. I went to all the homeless centres in Dundee. The first thing you do when you get into these homeless centres or these hostels is look for any literature. Is there any literature about child abuse? No. I've never found it. I've never seen it. And, I, I, and what I do is I go up to the managers and I talk to them, uh, staff. How, how many people are trained to recognise and deal with is n- nobody? So what do you do when survive? Or we refer them to the GP. Uh, nothing. So what you're talking about is it, it's not going. It's not happening because here's the thing. And again, I've, I've got this. Gordon Blackstock can, can confirm this. When I went up to Dundee, I went into homeless centres. And I speak to staff, never mind survivors and, and homeless people and pe- residents. Even the staff have never heard of the Child Abuse Inquiry. Anywhere above Edinburgh, people have never heard of it. So people now, here's the thing, John Sweeney comes on the television and he says, I'm, communi- I'm, I'm communicating with survivors and we're listening to survivors and we're doing what survivors... What he's doing is he's cherry-picking a very, very, very small group of survivors... And he's sitting with them, having a meeting with them. Now, those survivors in those groups, one or two groups, they don't even relay the information or the minutes to their own their own people in their own group. I know that because I talked to dozens of them. So how on earth is it going to get... The, the government don't put the minutes out. So 99.9% of survivors in Scotland don't know what these meetings are about. They don't know anything about the redress scheme. But John Sweeney will always come on the telly and say, I'm communicating with the survivor community. No, you're not. You're talking to nine, you're talking to less than 1% and you're not letting the whole country know what you're doing. So this redress scheme, nobody's going to know about it unless we do something. Yeah, absolutely. No, I know from Future Pathways when it first opened, I talked to the marketing people. There was a few people that I knew, a different group of people, they were willing to put these leaflets in surgeries and yeah, hospitals. Yeah, yeah. And they said, well, we do our own marketing. And we're sending it out to every GP surgery in the country. And no, I've never seen any. But also, th- this is <laughs> the, the bit I, I noticed since you raised awareness um, to me. When you look in, um, well, Furzo and Wick where I am and I know I've been in the Orkney Islands too, in in surgeries and hospitals for different reasons. If there is a leaflet about child abuse um, survivors, if there is, it's always tucked behind other literature. I've never seen one. I, I've been in all the homeless centres in Scotland. Never seen, never seen them. Don't know. I, I mean, again, I can't mention names. I don't. I don't want to put anybody you know in the spot. Um, I can't. I, I, I don't. I don't know anywhere where it where it exists because if it did exist, it would be overwhelmed within a day, within a couple of days, and and that's the point. They have to keep it under wraps because there's so many out there. So therefore, we again getting back to the the, the crutch of the meeting here tonight is about raising awareness about a public national conversation. You know, it's it takes courage, it takes determination, and it takes passion. Not just from the survivors, but the general public, people in the justice system, people in the social 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 works, you know, all 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 throughout Scotland. But so far, you know, it, it's it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking what's happening. Um, I've got and a, yeah. If it helps, I've got um, access to two good MSPs who knows about our situation, um, and maybe you should. Um, Right to that, because what they work on, and you know they work on this way, you have to be a part of their region. Now, okay, mm-hmm. I'm a part of their region, but there's no reason you can't write to all the MSPs in the Highlands and Islands, which the way they work up in the Highlands and Islands, you've got eight choices of MSPs. Two of them mm-hmm. um, are, are brilliant. You could say I'm, I'm working with Andy Peach, his wife, Joanne, his blah, blah, blah. Um and then that gets you into the door of being a local connection to that MSP. And then you can you know, ask him to lobby Parliament, because I'm sure he would. One of them's... I'll give you the names later. Yeah. See, when I was in Falkirk, when, when I was in Falkirk, standing outside for five days, this girl came up. She, uh, she says to me, she says, uh, can I get a cuddle? I said, of course you can, give her a cuddle. And uh, she... 
she was helping me doing something. I was, I was moving about and, and she was helping me. And, and I said, I need to talk to you. I said, that's okay. I said, well, come on, I'm going to get my dinner. So we went up to Weatherspoons and she told me, she says, um, when, when she was 10 or 12 years of age, her mother was an alcoholic and her mother was bringing men home at night, making them sleep, making her sleep with them. And uh, as a result, she was put in care. And when she came out of care, she had a boyfriend and it became abusive. And I met so many women in Falkirk just in that one week who'd suffered the same domestic abuse as a result of child abuse or connected with child abuse, whatever. And uh, she said to me, she said, I went to the police and I complained and nothing happened. Oh, OK. And then she said she had another relationship and it went the same way. And she said, I went to the police, but this time I told about the child abuse. I brought that up. And I also contacted the S M M M MSP, and I won't mention his name. And nobody got back to me. So, so I started drinking. And I ended up in prison. And she wasn't even 20, Andy. And she looked at me in the face and says, Dave, why does nobody listen? Well, we Here's the thing, you know, if, if, you know if, if we're going to wrap this up, let me just finish with this, Andy. All, all over the world, all over the world now, survivors are coming forward in the thousands, you know, especially uh, clergy abuse, you know, churches are reporting other churches, priests are coming forward reporting bishops, you know, and so on and so forth and so forth, all over the world. We, we, we've seen this recent figure with, with France. As I say, I've seen the spreadsheet, all the different countries, UK is in there. Lights are coming on all over the world now. And the more lights that are coming on, the more people are starting to look at Scotland and say, why is Scotland still so dark on this subject? And, and I seriously, seriously think there's going to come a time where the headlights are going to shine on Scotland and people are going to be saying, you know, we, we, we've handled this wrong. You know, I, I don't want... When I go to heaven, when God says to me, did you look after the children? I'll be able to say yes. But when he says, did you help those who couldn't help themselves? I'll also say, I tried. And I don't I don't have anger. I, I, I dealt with my anger a long, long time ago. You know, I, I don't get angry, but I, I, I say to these people, you, you, you need to you, you need to start changing your attitude around this subject. You need to start looking at this because uh, we, we've all got the answer at the end of the day. You know, and, and when I get to the gates of heaven, I want to be able to say, not only did I look after the children, I, I tried to guide people in the right way. You know, uh, I'm not saying love me, love me, I'm great. I'm not saying I'm I'm, I'm faultless. You know, I, I've I've suffered trauma my whole life, Andy. You know, I've, I've had a terrible life, a terribly hard life. But I've come out the other end a good person. And I am a good person. Um, and I'm willing to work with anybody, you know, uh, and, and I firmly, firmly believe we can do this. But, you know, it's what's it going to take? I don't know. I've not got the answers. What we need is people to come out, you know, and not with white, not with, not with white handkerchiefs. It's with swollen hearts. You know, this has to be a desired and, and passionate commitment because it's going to take a lot of commitment to do this. It's going to be hard work. But it could be made so much easier the more people that come forward. And, and you know, I, I was... Uh, just just the other day there, there's a... And, and, I, and I, I really, really don't want to... I'll be careful how I say this. I was online on Twitter and there's a, there's a new rehabilitation uh, rehab centre opened in Scotland. And he, he's, oh, I'm open to questions or anything. I said, well, what program to make survivors of child sex abuse feel safe enough to open up old wounds? And the guy said to me, he said, well, I usually, it takes four or five sessions before people open up to me. And I said, wouldn't you want to have a, 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 a situation where you, they will feel safe as soon as they come in the door? And his response was, do you guess what his response was? I agree with you 100%. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. Everybody wants to, everybody sees where we're going wrong, but nobody wants to step over that line, that commitment that says, hey, let's do this. 
let's all walk the same path. Let's all make sure that Scotland makes Scotland the safest country in the world for our children. Amen. It's Scotland's shame um, at the moment. has been for a long time. Let's pray to God tonight that and all survivors listen, pray to God that in your own circumstances, things will get better. Things are, you know, hard at the moment, but it it will get better. Um, Amen. Yeah. I just finished the show up now um, and wish everybody a great week. And thank you for listening to Andy and Dave Sharp on Horizon Talk Radio. Good night. God bless.